morning and thank you for being with us this beautiful Saturday morning. My name is Alero Idu. I'm Ayo Makine. Good morning and welcome to another day. Well, all kinds of things happening in our country and all kinds of things happening outside our country. Both far and near. Let's talk about the Olympics first. Well, we're not coming home empty-handed. <laughs> Isn't that something to chair? I hear you. Uh -oh. I mean, it's okay. We had that conversation with the PRO of the NOC while there in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. And he confessed something we all knew, which is the fact that we always rush when it's close. I asked him pointedly. Mm -hmm. We knew we were coming for the Olympics. Four years ago. Four years ago. We fact, always have four years ahead. Longer than four years ago. Because you could work out that, okay, if the next one is 2020, okay, like 24, exactly. 28, so you can start preparing three-year-olds now said, for the guy said, 2020, 2030, uh, whatever. He said, you know, you That's know how in, we our, are. in Nigeria, we always do things. Fire brigade. Fire brigade. I was, so, and I asked him, what are our hopes? One of our hopes was table tennis. Oh, we crashed out I early mean, there. according to him. According to the young man, mm -hmm. you know, we had hopes in table tennis and a number of others. Uh, basketball, he said we had hopes in basketball as well because of the way our boys had been doing, how well they'd been doing pre mm. the Olympics. And now here we are. Um, we have a medal in long jump now. And guess what? The two medals were won by women, no less. You don't have to rub it in, come on. So where are you, macho Nigerian men? We are, I'm sure I'm ruffling some feathers, some feathers right now. Well, but that's the intention. We are, admini we are administering the women. Oh, and you're administering them well. That's why they won medals. But you know, you, there, <laughs> we, we understand that there was uh, Ududuru had a hamstring. So the men also could have done something in the par games, you know. Yeah. If not that, you know. And you uh, know what made my heart systems. bleed? I think every other country had Nigerians competing for them. In fact, there was uh, some, I can't remember which sport it was, that two Nigerian, mm -hmm. <laughs> two Niger well, two. Nigerians in quotes, faced each, each other, but they were representing other Different countries. countries. Yeah, I saw the. I mean, the it's thing. so. Painful. And their names were clearly. Igu Nigerian. Names. You will hear Chijindu. Mm -hmm. You will hear <laughs> names like that. Oh, they're obvious Nigerians, and they've they've got other people's flags on them. It, it made me feel very, very unhappy. So why can't we just look after our athletes to keep them home? One even ran for Qatar. And they bought the flags of those countries with pride. I, I, I don't know. I don't know if there is anything we can do, you know, or anything that is possible to bring us home and, um, you know, encourage. I, I, I just don't know the kind of system that we need to evolve to ensure that that is done. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm still looking for it in my head. I, I, yeah, I have no that, idea. And that system we also need to keep our doctors home. Not just keep them home, keep them happy because they are essential services. I think it was yesterday, um, this interview happened with um, the Minister of Health. One of the things that he's quoted to have said is he's not going to meet, well, he said he will not meet with the resident doctors. Is that health? It was labor. Labor yeah, said he wasn't going labor, to meet here. Yes, says yeah. he's not going to meet mm -hmm. with the striking doctors. Mm -hmm. He's not. Uh, he's also saying that they're going to have to be replaced mm -hmm. if they do not go back to work. And where are you like going that. to find the replacements? Already, you don't have enough, and more are leaving every single day. These guys work under very trying circumstances. And then they don't get paid? I think there is something that we need to ah. give, give attention to, Alero. And everyone needs to know that. It, part of the conversation that we had in the course of the week on the other show is that, look, when this agreement was being drawn, had Labour 
in the meeting, had the health ministry in the meeting, was the finance ministry in that meeting, was the office of the accountant general in that meeting. To be aware that those monies were to be paid. The monies needed to be paid. Uh -huh. Was the MDCN in that meeting mm -hmm. who regulates the activities, the professional conduct of doctors yes. and all of that. Yes. Were they there? Don't forget that NARD went on strike, Johesu went on strike, NARD is now back on strike, and we're still having these conversations. So this threat that the minister is uh, uh, making may not be unfounded, because there is a, a Trade Unions Act, okay, a Trade Unions Essential Services Act, oh God. that says that the, the, it's an act to empower the president to proscribe any trade union or association the members of which are employed in any essential service, if such union or association has been engaged in industrial unrest, unrest or acts calculated to disrupt the smooth running of any essential service. Earlier in the week, I think I saw a headline of one of these papers that says, you know, quoted the federal government as saying, don't disrupt the economy, go back to work. Mm -hmm. Now, part of this law, Trade Unions Essential Services Act says that there are penalties for acts calculated to disrupt the economy. It's in the law. So if the federal government has said that, are they going in this direction? Question, question, question. question. <sighs> well, we're going to talk, talk about this matter at length in the course of today's program. So <laughs> maybe we should just keep our gunpowder dry. <laughs> <clears throat> yes, the marina. The metro line apparently is taking shape and the marina needs to be shut down so that the work can move as it should and the closure will be for a space of seven months or more. It says, at the, 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 the notice that I saw said at least seven months. Um. But um, I'm not quite sure where the diversion is going to be Marina, well, you say that since you don't go to the, to the island, you don't really care. No, I, I, I feel for you. I empathize with you. But it will be over before you know it. Yeah. Those who use the marina. <laughs> <laughs> and really, it is not really as, it's not, it's not going to be a tea party. It's not going to be a no, walk in the park no. for those who have to use the marina. Because... Central Business District. Exactly. Remember that during, when the uh, Third Midland Bridge was closed, you were told oh, that there were that diversions and all of that, and that there were alternate routes, ETC. Oh. Question that you want to ask is, did it even happen the, the way we, oh. had, we had it in mind at the time? Now, this is a Central Business District. I think communication needs to go out. There are very many roads you know, intra-city in roads being mended by state governments and the federal government all over the nation. There is mm. no doubt about mm. that. And a number of people who have traveled, especially to, you know, areas around the South-South, have praised the efforts of government at various levels to ensure that these things are done and the roads are better. I have a neighbor who praises the Federal Ministry of Works and Housing to high heavens that his roads are now better to go to, you know, his Easy. area, uh -huh. uh, his area and back. But the convenience of getting those things done, even if it's not going to be convenient, at least let there be some communication. I still feel that the number one issue we have in the nation, mm. in my opinion, is communication. It is. Not information. Because I would have thought that closing the marina would be big news that would be on every radio station, on every television station, every news item for the next few days, so that the whole, well, the Largely, negotiants yes. who use that, not just wake up on Monday morning and head there and find, ah, uh ah, -uh, road closure. Exactly. So where are we going to pass? Exactly. Because so, there's not been enough communication. I, I, I would always reference the <laughs> Babangida government of the, of the 80s. Yeah. They say that if there is anything to be done, they make a lot of noise about it and then all of that. So we need communication to go out. And there are tons of radio stations all over the place now. That partnership between the government and the media ought to be there. We don't need to be scavenging for information to yeah. get it. We shouldn't be like, if, we're, if, if we are partners in progress, come on. Let's it's interesting that you bring in IBB because I watched his interview yesterday. Oh. And it was a very interesting interview. And in fact, he did say, because the, the, the interviewer asked him, 
why is it that government is scared of the press? And he said, oh, no, I wasn't scared of the press because I always told what was going to happen. And when he was asked about corruption, he said, oh, my God, we were kiddies when you compare <laughs> corruption in our time to corruption today. And I was, I was very amused. <laughs> that was, a, that was a, a, a military government. Yes. But a democracy is a lot liberal. I don't even want to go into that one. There's a lot on the menu this morning. Mm, okay, okay. <laughs> so let's, let's go to the menu. Of course, we're going to be starting with, uh, we're going to shine a focus on the resident doctor's strike. Mm. Well, that's our first one. And then another issue, oh, we should have, we should have toothpicked on this one as yeah. well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the party uh, pol politics, uh, boosting parties' internal democracy, that's part of our conversation this morning. And then we'll be looking at wa Lagos waste management. Huh. Big, funny. Another big thing. Very funny issue. Mm. And of course, the artist of the week. Trust me, I have no idea whether it's a him or a shim or any other gender. But we do have an artist. So get your um, whatever you prefer. No, please say it. Say it, please. It's important that you... Um, get your cocoa or your cocoa. <laughs> 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 We're back after now. Just stay with us. <laughs> Thank you for joining us this beautiful Saturday morning. The Nigerian Association of Resident Doctors has called on the federal government to stand up to its responsibility and pay the salaries of striking doctors. Well, if you recall, government had um, ordered the doctors to get back to work yesterday. Of course, they didn't get back to work. And uh, government said yesterday that it was going to wield the big stick and said that no work would attract no pay. Yeah. So that's where we are now. And last night we heard the Minister of Labor saying that he was not prepared to meet with doctors anymore. So where does that leave us? What's going to happen now? Essential services, there's a pandemic, the hospitals are empty of doctors, where does that leave us, the citizens? Mm. And where does that leave the doctors if government is no longer going to dialogue with them? These and many more questions we're going to ask our guests this morning. And one of them is Dr. Francis Faduile, consultant pathologist and former president, Nigeria Medical Association, who joins us via Zoom. Good morning, Dr. Faduile. Would you please unmute yourself so that we can hear you? Good morning. Yes. I'm unmuted. Yes, we can hear it's you now. It's my pleasure to be with you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you clearly now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we also have Julian Ojebo, who is Chairman Communication and Communique, and immediate past first Vice President of the Association of Res National Association of Resident Doctors. He, he joins us from Abuja. Thank you very much for joining us this morning, Julian. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Right. Um, so let me begin with you, Mr. Ojibo. Um, now that the government, well, represented by the Minister of Labor, has said that he will not dialogue with the, the association anymore, where does that leave you guys? Much. Um, it's no longer news that we embarked on an industrial action on Monday, um, being the second day of August 2021, at 0, 0800 hours. Um, we're also privy to some of the information um, as um, posited by the Honorable Minister for Labor um, and employment yesterday on your show where he actually gave some um, information that were not so true. They were all um, leading with falsehood. Um, for starters, yeah, the ministers did say that um, the Nigerian Association of Resident Doctors did not notify him um, according to the trade um, dispute notification 
of the um, industrial action we were, we were going to embark on the um, 2nd of August. Now, that is a, that is a false statement. Um, with me here um, is a copy, acknowledged copy, that the association sent to the minister. Um, it's dated 25th of June, 2021, and was acknowledged on the 28th of June, 2021. We did not just give the federal government the 15 days notification according to the Trade um, Dispute Act. We gave them a 30 days notification. Also, not forgetting that um, this industrial action we embarked on currently is a suspended, okay, suspended action, which we did suspend sometime in April the 9th. So when the, when the minister says that... Um, he wasn't informed. Um, that is also falsehood. Also, let me quickly say some, some quick facts here. Um, the minister also did say that our house officers um, were actually placed on the um, MSS um, payment platform. That is also um, in error because the house officers were, in 2009, 2009 September, were placed on the commerce platform. Okay? Um, with the circular attached to it, this is, we also have... Um, we also have the circular also here, okay? That's the circular that places the house officer on the comments payment platform. He also did say that um, one of our grievances is that um, the head of service did raise a, a memo um, saying that our house officers have been removed from the scheme of service. Do you remove someone from a scheme of service that the person is not already on? So we, we really don't understand what he was trying to say. We also did say that sometime in, 2000, in 2020, COVID-19 um, emanated, okay, ravaging all across the globe. In the crossfire, we lost 19 of our members. Now, we approached the government in 2020, in, in um, July, and said we've lost 19 of our members, and we need them to benefit from the debt in service um, um, insurance. Now, these 19 members have not been paid their debt in um, service benefits. Now, they came up with a value that... Now, at the last meeting we held um, in, um, in July, where we paid a courtesy visit, now because of the failure of government to attend to our, our letter we wrote to them to inform them of the impending strike action four weeks prior to when we had the strike, we gave the minister a call and we said, sir, we've called your office, we've written to your office, and we've said that um, our members have not been paid. And he said, okay, you guys should come for a meeting. Mm. At that meeting, it was made clear, abundantly clear, that the office of the head of service has not been serious and has been playing games. Dr. Okay, they brought out a flimsy Dr. Uh, Dr. Dr. document I, I, I beg your pardon, Dr. 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 Five members, again in error, the minister said 95, it was 195. When we went through that list, at that table, we found out that our members were not included in the 195 um, names that were published by the various insurance companies to be paid their debt and um, service benefits. Okay, now we went further. The minister did say he was going to expedite um, um, the motion so that these are members will be included. He gave two days. We reached out to the office of the head of service and nobody attended to us. That is just one. We talked about migration of our members to the IPPIS platform. Now just at the, me at the meeting, at the instance of the um, of the um, Honorable Speaker of the Federal House of Representatives, he did say that our members were going to be migrated within two weeks. Within that two weeks that the um, Honorable um, um, Speaker of the House of Representatives, right on the Bufemic Baja Biamila, when he did say that they were going to move our members, we noted that just within five days, the head of service released a circular instructing that that um, migration should be halted. Why was it halted? We have no idea. We okay. reached out to the Minister of Labor again, reached out to the Minister of Health, and they did not attend to any of these matters. We also did say that our members have not been paid their due salaries. Salaries. Dr. Not Jebo. any other allowance. Salaries. Dr. Our Jebo. members on this GIFMIS platform. Dr. Jebo, I, did, I do beg your pardon. Uh, regarding the notice of the strike. The minister said that the document he received was uh, like minutes of your meeting in Umwahia, not a notice that a strike was imminent. I have, this is the document. This is not a communique 
This is not a communique. Okay, I'm the chairman of the communique um, a committee. This is not a communique from Umaya. Umaya was in, um, in July. This letter is dated 29th of June 2021. This was the date of reception of the letter. And I'm close, this, is the, this is not the stamp of um, the President Uri Lawa. This is not the stamp of Julian Ojebo. This is the stamp of the Federal Ministry of Labor. Acknowledging that fact. So I, I don't understand wh wh where the minister is coming from. You know, we've always said that appointees of government, um, we've always appealed to the Nigerian Medical Association to ensure that appointees of government have what we call the mini, mini mental state examination because we really don't understand. Because is this some form of um, amnesia? Is this some form of um, not really knowing what is really going on in the ministries? Okay. Are they trying okay, to thank you, Dr. Jebo. on purpose? Thank is you, Doctor. Let, let, me, let me bring in uh, Dr. Fadwili. You are a senior doctor. What are your thoughts about all this that's going on, all this backing and forthing? You know, this has been going on now for years, yet the issues cannot seem to be settled so that these doctors are happy at their jobs. Thank you very much, Alero. It is really unfortunate that we are finding ourselves in this state again. We have uh, always believed that uh, the government should be responsible and responsive to the yearnings of the population. And in this respect, I must say that what we have had serially is government not uh, falling up or not uh, ensuring that the agreements that they have with the Nigerian Medical Association, the Nigerian Association of Resident Doctors is uh, followed. And I can tell you on this particular one, it is uh, really unfortunate. The resident doctors have uh, stayed and they have actually extended uh, their, 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 their residence to ensure that they discharge services to Nigerian uh, populace. Unfortunately, we have a government who has not done the needful. For example, can we explain why doctors have not been paid up for up to four months, five months? And this is normal duty that they have rendered. Unfortunately, also, we have to ask, why do government come out with a policy of changing uh, the payment platform from DIPMIS to IPPS, from this, and you are putting people who are doing their legitimate work at risk of not getting salary for up to five, six months. And if they have had agreement and the government has promised that they will do some, uh, some of their part, is it acceptable that the government will come six months, seven months later and still telling us the same story that they have not paid. Can you beat a child and you still hold the child not to cry? It is not possible. For example, we have house officers who are just coming in. All over the world, house officers have always been in the scheme of service of medical career. How did they get to this level in which they said they are expunging house officers from being in the scheme of service? Of what benefit? If you have other medical associations, allied medical professionals that you want to control, control them, why are you changing what has been internationally accepted? We made this known to them. We had a lot of discussion with the head of service, and they said they would do something. But by the time they start putting bottlenecks, you have difficulties. And even the, ha the hazard allowance that we are talking about, they have come out, the government has come out and said that it is paltry, it is, it is, it is not good that they are paid 5,000 naira hazard allowance. But what are we being paid today? That is close to one, uh, about 16 months after we have had um, COVID in this country, they are still being paid the paltry 5,000. Those who have died in the course of duty, who contracted COVID while they were treating patients, and they died. Pay the supreme price for this country, and we are still, as of today, still dilly-dallying on how to pay them. Will that be an incentive for doctors to go out and go and face the treatment for 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 for, for Nigerian populace? And I can tell you, as a 
teacher and as a trainer. In my departments, where we used to have about seven, eight resident doctors, we barely have one. And the work cannot progress without having resident doctors to complement the duties of the consultants. A lot of them are leaving this country in droves, and we need to stop it. This action that the government is displaying will not help the health system of this country. We need to prevail on the government to do the needful because we cannot continue to say the same thing over and over again, and we expect that we will have improvement. The ranking of Nigeria in terms of health has been abysmally low. We are ranked close to places where there are war torn, war -torn countries, Afghanistan, people places like Somalia, and Nigeria prides itself as the giant of Africa, the largest, uh, la largest uh, black nation in the world. I think we need to change the narrative. We need to do more. The government needs to be more transparent. The government needs to put a lot of things in place to sustain the health system of this country. And this is why we are calling on the government. The threat that we want to sack them has been a threat that we have, we have had from time immemorial. It has not worked. It will not work. And it will not do any, it will not be of any benefit to anyone. The hospital, is, the health system in this country is going down by the day, by the day. And every concerted effort must be in place to improve it and not this war song by the government who has failed repeatedly to pay ordinary salary for its workforce. Dr. Ojibo, uh, the last strike action was in April and uh, some agreements were reached before NAD agreed to go back to work. So between April and now, what has happened regarding the agreements that made doctors go back to work in April? Now, this is the, this is the addendum to the memorandum of action that was signed at the instance of the um, Honorable Minister of Labor. In this addendum, it has six, six subheadings signed by all signed by both the President of Nigeria, um, Nigerian Association of Resident Doctors, Secretary of the NME, the um, Director of Hospital Services, Director of IPPIS. As I speak to you, not one, not one of these items, not one of these items have been completed to 60%, not one. Let me start from the first one. Non-payment of house officers. As we speak, 114 of our members have not been paid their salaries for one to six months one to six months. Over 550 of them have not been paid for two months. That is just number one. In that number one, they set up a committee to look into these issues, but they weren't, it wasn't done. These are the members of the committee from the Federal Ministry of Health. The chairman was Maha. The uh, MDCN had Henry as the secretary. IPPI has asked ACO. NMA has um, Philip Ekbe. NAD has our financial secretary, who is um, Kinsley Okeke, and the committee of CMDs was represented by Dr. Jaff Momo. As I speak to you, over 550 of our members have not been paid for two months. 114 of them have not been paid between one and six months. That is for house officers. We move on to the second one, abolishment of bench fees. As I speak to you, the um, CMD of Luth, Professor Chris Bode, has renamed the bench fee to be training fee and has collected between the sum of 250,000 Naira to 300,000 Naira. We have Payments receipts for these are members that have been paid and it has been abolished. That is number two. Non payment of um, national minimum wage consequential adjustments, nothing has been done about it. Our members are still being owed all across um, 74 um, uh, member centers in the country, both states and federal. Payment of salary shortfall 2014 to 2016. In 2013, because we do forget history easily. In 2013, in the National Industrial Court of Nigeria, the um, um, other health workers approached the um, courts. They were given, um, they were given a, an injunction where they were, they were skipped. We approached the federal government for relativity to be achieved. Relativity, they started paying relativity in 2014. In 2014. Now, when they started paying relativity, they were now owing our members, okay? 
we now reached a memorandum of I am memorandum of understanding in 2016 that our arrears from 2014 to 2016 will be paid. This is what um, gave birth to this 2014 to 2016 um, um, short salary shortfalls that we had. The government has reneged on those um, of its promises, so we're not paid. And that I'm not even talking about the specialist allowance that have been owed to all the specialist registrars across the country. Our members have been owed specialist allowance, and we, they've never said anything about it all across the country, both state and federal. Now, let's come to the crux of the matter residency training allowance. The, gov the, the, the Minister of Labor did say last night that um, um, he quoted a figure which was about 3.7 billion. Now, that is in error. In 2020, gracious to the um, Honorable Speaker um, of the House of Rep, four billion was, um, was given for medical residency training funding. Now, also in error, they are not giving us money for accommodation. They're not giving us money for books. We pay for our books. We pay for our accommodation. What we are saying is that pay for the exams that we are going to write. That is what, and that's what brings about that money for medical residency training funding. So when, when they come with some, um, some, um, some things that doesn't even make sense to even a, a two-year-old, it, it actually gets disgusting and, 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 and annoying, okay? We're saying that pay us what you're owing us. Now, he also said on TV last night that they have paid us for 2021. How would you pay me money and I'm not aware you have paid me? We are telling you that you're owing us areas for 2019, you're owing us areas for 2020, and you've also not paid for 2021. And you're coming on TV and you're telling us that you have paid. I think that's some administrative rascality mixed with administrative lethargy. It shouldn't Excuse be said you. at all in any parlance. On, on, on this we same issue, you know, there's always a lot to, to, to pack into this kind of conversation. And I, 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 I can relate with how difficult it must be for the people, medical doctors who train for years and who are involved in this issue. Uh, I, I'll, I'll take some other issues to Dr. Fadiele later, but for you, uh, one of the things that the Minister of Health said was that the NERD needs to work with the NMA and your history because some of those conversations um, had to do with, it's, it's more holistic than just something concerning NERD. It also involves NMA and Johisu as well, that you need to work together on that. And he also said that some of the issues um, that are on the table are responsibilities of states, states, direct employees of the doctors, and not something to do with the federal government. Uh, what's your reaction to those? Thank you so much. This is the communique that we have stating, detailing all our issues that vis-a-vis um, -vis the federal and the state government. Now, let me, even, let me even move to the state government, okay? Now, you know, in Nigeria, we are quick to copy things that are wrong. In Nigeria, we are quick to copy things that are wrong. Now, um, all our issues that we have both in the federal um, government, we also have in the state government. Now, let me bring out one governor out of the park, Senator Dr. Ifan Atokowa. I'm actually happy the minister referenced that he worked with um, Senator Dr. Ifan Atokowa um, in the 7th Assembly, okay? But he's not doing what the um, um, Senator Dr. Ifan Atokowa is doing. As we speak, our members in Delta State, um, under the Delta State employ, are collecting the medical residency training funding, okay, so that they can enroll for the August, um, sep um, the, the August deadline um, for their exams in September, October, November. Okay? Senator Dr. Ifan um, Atokowa also did pay our members um, three months of the COVID inducement allowance, not forgetting that the government paid with, with so much irregularities the COVID hazard inducement allowances, where he promised, the government did promise to pay six months and they paid between one and three months for some of our members, and some of our members didn't even get anything. Okay? Um, Imagine a governor, we, went, we met with the governor, the governor of Abia State, um, sometime um, last week, and he told us categorically to our faces that he is owing 19 months, that he was going to pay three months out of the 19 months. Now, the three months he said he was going to pay was on Monday. Today is Saturday. Our members have still not collected anything. So it, it goes to show that there's so much insincerity in, in political appointees, in, in 
office um, office holders, and they're not just true to what they are saying. Now, also in responding to what you also asked, when he said that um, all of the issues, seven out of the ten issues were were um, from from the state government, that is quite laughable. Okay, you know, like I said earlier. We need to do mini mental state examination for some public office holders because the things they say, it's, it's uh, Dr. Ajabo, kindly speak to, before. please Show speak to the issue so it doesn't look or sound. One, one second, on please. Point. Just Turn one second. Just one second, Dr. Ajabo. Please speak to the issue and uh, try not to, you know, cast aspersions on personalities because, I mean, uh, they are ent everyone is entitled to whatever it is that they want to say. It's a freedom of expression. Please try to avoid casting aspersions on persons. Speak to the issue that has been raised. Uh, the, you have tried to answer some states. But if it is the responsibility of some states to take on certain issues, why not take on those issues with those states? Because making it a national thing is all looking like it's the federal government that's been, you know, uh, responsible all the while and consequently uh, shifting the responsibility of the state governments that are themselves in a way autonomous on the federal government. Now, let me address this issue head on. These are the observations that was made at the end of the neck that our members have not been paid January, February, March, April, May, June, July in, um, under the GFMIF plat platform, particularly in UPTH, which is a federal institution, University of Illori Teaching Hospital, which is a federal institution, University of Calabar Teaching Hospital, which is a federal institution, University College Hospital, which is a federal institution, that is one. There was also the release by the um, head of service, a memo released by the head of service um, that said that they should stop the payment the migration and payment of our members on the GFMIS platform. That is also the duty of the federal government. We also said that um, 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 we've not received the 2021 medical residency training funding. We also said that we, we have areas for 2019 and 2020, which is also the, um, the duty of the federal government. We also did say that our members have been extorted by um, members, um, by, by some CEOs and some CMDs, um, and we named the bench fee that was abolished to um, training and training fee is also a duty of the federal, federal government. We also did say that um, our members have not been paid the debt and benefit service, which is also the duty of the federal government. We also did say that we've not, um, over 16 months after the government reached an agreement with us that they were going to review the hazard allowance, it's still not been reviewed. It's also the duty of the federal government. We also did say that our members are shortly, um, um, at, as a result of the brain drain that we have in the country, our members are overworked, our staff strength has reduced, it's also the duty of the federal government. We also did say that, um, we also did say that um, some of our members have not been paid the COVID hazard inducement allowances in all of the states, in all of the um, um, federal teaching hospitals, it's also the duty of the federal government. So I have given you nine items nine items that are the duties of the federal government. Now, let me come down to the states. We're saying that some states, states like Abia, Imo, and um, 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 University of um, Medical Sciences in um, um, University of Medical Sciences, um, Baru Diko um, Teaching Hospital in Kaduna State, um, uh, Ekiti State University Teaching Hospital have been owed 18, 6, 3, 2, and 1 months respectively. Now, that is the only item that we have said in the communique that is left at the, um, at the preserve of the state government. So, I don't understand what you mean by it's not um, the duty of the federal government. All right. All right. Thank you, I've Dr. Jebo. Oh, we'll we'll come to so other issues. Just one second. Um, Dr. Fadi Ile, one thing that I, I believe you should be able to speak to confidently and authoritatively is the, the conversations that should be going on between the NMA and NARD, which is supposed to be a, 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 a member of the NMA. Um, you are a former president of the NMA, so I'm just wondering what kind of conversations do you think should have been happening? Because many would say, for now, we haven't really heard the NMA say anything about this particular issue. Thank you very much. Uh, I think it is important for us to know that the NMA treats the affairs of its affiliate bodies 
as also very important to its uh, own uh, organization. In this regard, all the uh, meetings that uh, the Nigerian Association of President Doctors have had with the government, there have always been an NMA representation. We have had several, uh, the name of uh, Dr. Philip Ekwe, who is the Secretary General of Nigerian Medical Association. At our last ADM, uh, the National Asso Nigerian Association of Resident Doctors presented their case. And the NMA is fully in support of this particular group of people who are requesting that these are their due and the government is supporting. NMA has not come in because we have up to seven athletes of NMA and we cannot declare a war to bring everybody to war. We are war. The Nigerian Medical Association is watching closely. We are hoping that the government will do the needful. We are supporting both uh, the resident doctors and our members who are in the government to, elect, to let them know that they needed to do something urgently so that we cannot, we should not continue to have disruption in the health, in the health services. Of course, enemy is in the background, is in the know, and the resident doctors, all the things that they have put forward are things that are for the resident doctors. And in this wise, the Nigerian Medical Association has allowed the National Nigerian Association of Resident, resident Doctors to lead the discussion. When I was NMA president, we had several meetings I attended. I just sit by, moderate some things in case we want to have some detailed arguments, and we move forward. We were able to get some uh, uh, major breakthrough. And we are hoping that the government, in this instance, does the right thing. We need the government to come open and let every, everything to be resolved. You know, the resident doctors are not asking for something new. They are not bringing any any new uh, 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 any new uh, conditions into what has been done. The government needs to follow the uh, memorandum of uh, uh, agreement or understanding, whichever one they call it, that they have signed with everybody. In your intro, I heard that uh, where the different departments of uh, different ministries were they at uh, the different discussion? Yes, they were. The, pre the question is, once you live there, what happens? Everybody go back to sleep. And it is really, really unfortunate. Dr. Fadili, uh, just one second. I, I think that is where the problem is. You know, if there is an agreement, and everyone was there. Is that indicative that there is no will, there was no will in the first place to to solve the problem? You talked about the fact that you know, some some of your members who are in government ought to be doing something. We all know it's something that is known to you. The Minister of Health is a medical doctor and a member of your association. The Minister of Labor. State is a member of your association and yeah. is a medical doctor. The Minister of Labor is yeah. a member of your association and he is also a medical doctor. So what, in your opinion, would be the problem? Thank you very much. I must say that at this junction, we must know that the government will not come out to start blaming themselves. The Minister of Health can do as much as he can. The Minister of State for Health can do as much as he can. They cannot bring out money from the coffers of the government. Even the Minister of Labor, that is a medical doctor, is by chance. It's not as if that that is a position that is for medical doctor. And we want to appreciate uh, Dr. Nguyen, but he has to know that when legitimate activities for doctors, it's not as if that we are taking him out of the medical scheme. He is talking like a labor minister, and we accept that. But for these issues, it goes beyond him coming and saying, it's a doctor, therefore he can prescribe and say, this is how it should be. The resident doctors need to be paid. And there is nothing anybody can do beyond that. If you have not paid, you are saying, well, no work, no pay. The work they have done, have you paid? He will come to equity, must come with clean hands. Has he done what is necessary in the first instance? If they have not done that, I don't think the justification is there for you to say that you have not paid some people who have legitimately worked for one, two, three, four, five months, and they are saying that they should continue working when you have not uh, brought out a way to settle it. 
We, the, the, the resident doctors have told us that they have gone to, to IPPI separately. They have told us that the health of service has brought out circular, which are inimical to the dictates of the agreements that they have reached. Is it within the, 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 the activity of the resident doctor to get this done? No, it is the ministry. But we will not have the ministers, all the different ministries coming here to start castigating themselves. They have to do what is needful. The resident doctors, the medical uh, practitioners, they have had enough patience for them to ensure that the health system of this country uh, continues to move without disruption. But the government, not Dr. Ndike, not Ministry of Health, the entire government must do what is necessary for them so that we can continue to have a smooth health system. In this regard, what they have agreed are things that they have, they, they are requesting the ministry to do, nothing new. Why is it difficult for them to do it? Chief Jim Blaine, casting as fashion, these are not the things that we should be talking. How do you pay for everybody who has not been paid? Those who have died in the line of their duty, how do you get their money to them? It's not about rhetoric, it's not about story. It's about getting it done. And it is not good thing. The, the public of the Minister of Labor is not within the public of the Minister of Health. If they are actually, if they have actually done their part, let them come out. If you say there is no money, let us hear that there is no money. But you are not saying anything, you are saying that resident doctors and other uh, health, uh, health, health workers should continue to work without having any uh, end in sight. It is not possible. It cannot work. And this is why we must. And I think every Nigerian should demand from the government to do the needful, to save the health system in this country. Things are going really, really bad. I am a practitioner in this country, and I can tell you that we are having a very big problem within the hospital. The resident doctors are having a hell of activities, a, a lot of pressure on them. They are having burnt out, and burnt out syndrome, I mean, and a lot of them are leaving the shores of this country. So uh, are we ready to stop this tight? It is left for the government. Dr. Hmm. Fadule, let me just play devil's advocate here. Suppose the government cannot afford to pay all these things and it's not willing to actually say it is not. Because we have seen uh, in the last year or so, how government has been trying all kinds of, uh, should I say, ruses to try and raise more money. We've seen that happen, haven't we? Well, if the government come out and they say they can't pay, it's another discussion. If they come out and they say they can pay, it's another discussion, let them come out. Let's hear them first. If they say that, then we'll come back and we'll discuss. But I can tell you, there is opportunity cost for everything. The actions of the government or the inaction of the government will have a long-term effect, a spiral effect on the general populace. The health system is in comatose now because resident doctors are on strike. Thousands of people are dying, and this, this debt is at the neck of the government because they are not going to be food. So I think it's important for us, for everybody to come clean. Government says, I can't pay, let us hear from them. And let us, let us start the discussion from there. But it is not when you have had an agreement, they have signed a memorandum of understanding, they have signed a memorandum of action, they have promised it, they have said they will do this, they will do that. I think moving, moving government from, moving, moving doctors from GIFNIS to IPPS is not about money. It's about policy. Ensuring that the insurance pay for those people who have died in the course of their duty is not about money. It is insurance who is, who is going to pay. Okay? And making sure that the medical, uh, the, 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 the bank fees appropriate is, uh, is uh, abolished is not about money. It's about ensuring that what you have passed to the CMDs are followed in total. These are not about money. These are about the will of the government to do the needful. And I think we need to hang everything on the neck of the government so that they know the implication of their, what they are doing. Asking doctors 
or telling them that you will now do no work, no pay. In the first instance, they have done pay and you have not paid them. So why was the justification of saying no work, no pay? And I think we need to condemn it in all the time. Okay, well, uh, Dr. Jebo, um, again, let me also join Alera in playing the devil's advocate here. Um, in, earlier in the week, we had a conversation along this line uh, where government brought up that uh, judgment uh, where, which says we, where a court, an industrial court in uh, Inugun sat and said that it was unlawful for essential services organizations such as yourselves uh, should go on strike. Join that in your conversation with this Trade Disputes Essential Services Act, which uh, sections, there are sections that says it's an act to, prov to empower the president to proscribe any trade union or association, the members of which are employed in any essential service, if such union or association has been engaged in industrial unrest or acts calculated to disrupt the smooth running of any essential service. Earlier in the week, we heard the minister say that the uh, NARD members should not destabilize Nigeria and that they should go back to work. When we juxtapose all these, do you see a situation where the NARD could be proscribed if uh, you do not return to work within the shortest possible time? Um. Ayo, thank you so much. You know, like I said, we, we're quick to forgetting history. Ransom Kuti in 1983, himself being the Secretary General of the NME and his other members of the um, National Officers Committee, were prescribed. So we are not new to them saying they want to prescribe us. In 2014, our members were sacked under the good luck of the Jonathan government. In Lagos State, Fashion, um, Dr. Um, Engineer Raji Fashola sacked 783 of our members in Lagos State. So we're not new to all of these things. Okay, so when they say all of this, it's just um, laughable. Also, let me go to the, um, the judgment in the industrial court. Um, when we discussed with our lawyers, it was made clear, abundantly clear, that the judgment at the point was in 2014, okay, where the... Um, the trade dispute notification was not in accordance to the Trade Dispute Act. And I've showed you here today, I've showed you here, this is a notification letter. We followed all the dictates of the Trade Dispute Act in ensuring that we do what we are supposed to do. As it stands, our members already are destabilized. Our members are impoverished. Our members are in pains because of the loved ones they've lost. So what more kind of pain do you want to inflict on us that will be worse than what you've already done to us? The pain we are in already, it, it, like they put in social media, we are in severe pains, as it were. Very, very severe pains. So if you now tell us that you want to do more than what you've done to us, it, it just comes to us as a as a root shock. If they go by what they have said, where they want to attach, um, what we feel right now, what the government is doing is administrative lethargy. Because you have signed a memorandum of action and you have not done that. And then you now come and you're telling us that according to the sec um, section 43, 1A of the Trade Dispute Act, you are going to do no work, no pay. It's a fusion of administrative rascality with administrative lethargy. So we don't understand what, what you mean by um, we are trying to disrupt the Nigeria. We already disrupted as it was. We are already in pains. Pan, both federal and state government. So what are you talking about? We are already in pains. Uh, talk to us about the death in service insurance. If it's an insurance, what has it got to do with the government? Shouldn't it be an insurance company paying that to the families? Okay, thank you. There's something we call the group life insurance, okay, where the government also pays its own parts 
of the money and the um, insurance company pays its own part. Okay, now there's usually this um, um, synergism between both arms of government, usually at the, at the behest of the um, office of the head of service. Okay, but now we found out over time that the office of the head of service is not giving us the true pictures. So at different meetings we've had, we've had to tell um, members, um, the, the conciliators of each of these meetings, that we think that there is um, dishonesty as at the level of um, the head of service. So when they brought out, a, when they brought out a, a memo and showed to us at that conciliatory meeting that 195 of um, 195 healthcare workers have been paid this um, group um, um, life insurance, we found out that our 19 members were not included, not one. They were not included. And we drew their attention at that table. We drew the attention of the, um, representative, the representative of the head of service that our members have not been included. Now, they also brought out some checks and said we should go through the checks. And we told them, we, we presented the names, the phone numbers, and the details of their nest of kin to them. That's how detailed the Nigerian Association of Resident Doctors are. We don't go to any meetings unprepared. We gave them names, addresses, phone numbers, and the um, contacts of the next of kin of our members that are died. And we said, these names are not included. And the minister did say at that forum that they were going to expedite action to ensuring and he told us in 48 hours they were going to get back to him. In that same 48 hours, they also said we should also bring all these documents to the office of the head of service. The, the sitting first vice president went to the office of the head of service and waited for four hours and was now told that the head of service was not on seat. So how do you want us to reconcile these gray areas? So it is quite difficult when people that are supposed to do their jobs are actually not doing their jobs. It's something very troubling. So we really don't know where to go from here. Yeah, j just one second. Um, let me ask both of you, but I'll start with Dr. Fadili on this one. Uh, there is also the belief in some quarters that sometimes after government has done the needful, uh, paying all of these funds to train the doctors, some of them just up and go get out of the country. Uh, could, do you think that could in any way be part of the reason why government is reluctant, mm -hmm. knowing that some of them could complain of uh, uh, unsatisfactory conditions of service and consequently leave the country? Thank you very much. I think uh, we have to look this from uh, the, uh, uh, the, the background of cause and effect. Uh, when you have resident doctors who, after the difficulties passed through the residency training and they get uh, uh, to become a consultant, and you have them sometimes up to six months not having any employment. And we have so many consultants who are looking for employment. I have many of them who have uh, approached me uh, that uh, I should help them to seek employment. Again, we have many of them who have been employed and they have not been gainfully, uh, they, are not, they have not been paid salaries for upward of five months, six months. I'm talking about consultants. We have many medical officers who are roaming the streets of this country and they do not have work. Will you advise sir, that they should continue to be resilient, resilient in their house with hunger and they will not find somewhere to get themselves? Uh, gainfully employed, it is difficult. Some of us who have decided to stay at home have, uh, have has believed that we must improve what is on ground. Outside the country, I can tell you doctors and especially Nigerian doctors are highly valued and highly prized, even in the contiguous West African countries. It is the same malaise that we are seeing with the government for the residency training that we are seeing in the entire health system. Many of our, our state hospitals are not opening spaces for doctors to be employed. Many hospitals that so, you're supposed to have about six, seven, eight doctors, you may barely have one. And you can, you can understand 
the health status of the people around that area, the, how, the, how it will affect the health status of the people around that area. And for consultants, I can tell you many of our federal health institutions that need to have a lot of consultants in place, many of them are not uh, uh, advertised or employed consultants. So it is not as if doctors are leaving this country when they have opportunity to get employed. It is because after you have, after the government and the doctors have sacrificed a lot to get themselves trained to become highly skilled medical uh, professionals, the government refused to open the pathway for them to get employed. And again, we have issues that are confronting the medical profession. You have heard about all the complaints by the resident doctors. And I must tell you, many of our residents are living by the time we are in month one, you will hear about five of them have left. By the time you get to the sixth month, you will hear up to 30 of them have left even when they are in training, because the training, you cannot, you, you do not know the end of your training because of this uh, strike action or these uh, disruptions that we have here and there. And lastly, it is important for government to improve the hospital uh, of, uh, facilities and equipment. Many hospitals, they are just hospitals in building, and that is what the government like to praise. They have built this, they have opened 200 bed hospitals, they have done this, but go and look at the equipment, you don't have them. And one of the things that pains any health professionals, especially consultants and doctors, is for you to see a patient who wish you know what you can do, you have the skill to do what you can use, uh, what you can do to save such life, and you see those deaths. You just have to see about five or six of such deaths and you, just, you get this example, you want to go to somewhere you can actually intervene to make things better. So the whole essence still falls with the federal government, with the state government. The premium they are putting on health is so little. And the reason is health is usually intangible. And politician wants to show something that is tangible for them to say, look, I have done this, I have done that forgetting that a healthy nation is a wealthy nation, forgetting that health is wealth. People, Nigerian populists, must demand from any of the levels or the tiers of the government that the government must provide good health for them. The primary health care center is, uh, the primary health care level is almost comatose all over the country. The secondary is gradually decaying to a level of zero. Many of our general hospitals are down, nothing is happening. Many states, you have heard about that, they say, for example, they have not paid their doctors for upward of 13, 16 months. That is over a year. And you expect the people to work effectively. And what will happen? Just, just one second. Way. Just one second, Dr. Farid. It's something that you said earlier, you know, piqued my interest, and I think it is something that you may want to speak to further. You said that Nigerians should demand for the kind of health care delivery system that they want. The question is, how? Thank you very much. At the time when the health workers want to go on strike, before we have organization of all the association, we will have some other uh, union who will plead with the Nigerian Medical Association or other health uh, workers association that please don't go. You are there for our health. We'll fight the fight for you. But today we are having Labor Congress looking the other way, we have Dwesu looking the other way, we have GUC looking the other way. They, they said to the, back to back to your tent, oh, oh Israel. Everybody down start fighting for themselves. And this is the balkanization of the divide and rule that the government has put in place. And that is what they are trying to put in the uh, issue of resident doctors and NMA. NMA is fully backing the resident doctors. We cannot come out and say we do not know what the uh, National, National Association of Resident Doctors are doing. They cannot cause that division. We need Nigerians because we are dying. Doctors are dying during strike. Non-doctors are dying during strikes. We need to have to come together and say enough is enough. If resident doctors, if uh, Labour Congress, if TUC, if ASU, if everybody comes and says, look, 
Though we have our own problem, health is paramount to us. We must settle this health issue. I can tell you that we will change the narrative. But everybody is on the own. And that is how we have gotten ourselves, the resident doctors, the Nigerian Medical Association, to a position in which we have to fight for ourselves. At the time, doctors are in their clinics and taking care of people. They don't care about how much comes to them. But today, if you don't, those people, every other person will get what their benefit is or are. And at the end of the day, you will be left alone. You can see a classical example. They said they want to give uh, debt something to uh, insurance to one rate or something. And not a single resident doctor is included. Do you want the resident doctors to leave their clinics and start sitting down with the head of service or with the, in the different ministries to get those uh, benefits done? We always trusted that the government will do its part, the workers there will do their part, and we will be able to have our own without any level of uh, lobbying or any level of looking at our, at our shoulders. But this is the problem we have in Nigeria. So we want to also call on the, on the populace. It is time for us to demand for our health. They say that health is personalized. If I am sick, if I have the money, I can go to uh, Colombia, uh, to the US, to UK, to anywhere. They say it's personalized. But for many of us, it is not personalized. It is what the government has given us. And the government must make sure that things are done. The doctors have come out at the time that every political office holder should not go out of this country. They should use the health facilities that they are put in place. No, they, 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 they refuse that. If any one of them is sick, they fly out of this country and they go and meet doctors. And many of them, they meet Nigerian doctors. They will not come back and want to replicate those things in this country. And it is the populace, it is the masses that bears that bear the brunt. We need the masses to rise up. Okay. Government by resident doctors, by Nigerian Medical Association, are not primarily supposed to be to, for us. It's okay. supposed to be for okay. every one of us. Okay. All right. Dr. Ojebo, in closing now. So with the minister saying that he will not dialogue with doctors anymore. What happens now? Where do we go from here? What next? Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, like, like um, we've always done. We've always um, taught the part of diplomacy. We've always taught the part where whenever they call us for negotiations, we're always ready to turn up and listen and um, posit the position of the... Um, National Executive Council. If the Minister of Labor, who sits as the conciliator, is saying he's not going to call um, for any form of discourse, dialogue, um, give or take, uh, we will just sit down and watch. Okay. We don't have anything to do. We've explored all the options that exist. We've written several communiques. We've written several pleas to the government. And if they don't want to attend to us, at okay. this point, I think we've gone to our breaking limits. OK. We've gone uh, to our breaking limits. Dr. Julian uh, Ojebo is uh, Chairman, Communication uh, and Communicate, and immediate past first vice president of the National Association of Resident Doctors. He joined us from our studio in Abuja. And Dr. Francis Faduile is a consultant pathologist former president, Nigeria Medical Association, and he joined, he joined us virtually. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, Dr. Ojebo says, so now we just sit down and watch. In the meantime, what happens to the sick? What happens to those on admissions in hospitals? Well, maybe we'll just all resort to prayer. See you in just a moment with another interesting conversation. This song is very interesting is. <laughs> <laughs> because of you. You're talking about, you know, God intervening in a matter that, you know, when the enemy comes against you, the question you want to ask is, in this issue of party internal politics, who is the enemy? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so many things, especially because there's been so many defections in the parties from one party to another, you know, of late. And of course, we all know that that's not new. That's been happening forever, especially among the two leading political parties now, the APC and the PDP. Um, defection, various leadership, tussle and controversy continue to play among party members and it recurs over and over again, lingering year in, year out and um, all of that. Earlier in the, I think it was this week or last week, there was a conversation on channels television with a former governor of Bielsa State who said, look, is this right? No, but that's what we have ourselves now, you know, having to deal with. Mm. Let's examine some of the issues and how it affects you watching us right now and how it will if we do not do the needful. Dr. John Ekundaya joins us this morning. He is a leadership researcher. Thank you for joining us today. We have uh, Dr. Yunus Atanko, who is uh, Chairman, National Conscience Party. He joins us along with Ahmed Busari, who is a former presidential candidate in our Abuja studio. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us this morning. All right, yeah. But uh, Dr. Kuna, le let me begin with you. Um, so many things have been happening. Uh, uh, governors, have defected from one party to the other, uh, from this party to other. It's gone both ways. You want to make it look it's so nice by saying they have they more, crossed carpets. I think more have been to APC than PDP. The point is, oh, they your, moved. Sins, your sins are now forgiven. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've, we've heard okay. that one. That, that's mm. not my, my, my question. For, um. for, for me, um, mm. there are those who say that it's easy for the parties to cross carpets, to mm. use Hilaro's word, <laughs> so easily because the, the lines of ideology are blurred. Is that right? Uh, and then there are those who say there are certain interests at play for both the individuals and the parties. There are those who say, you know, from what, uh, I'm drawing from what Hilaro just said now, that some cross into the ruling party. They always have to cross into the ruling party mm -hmm. to avoid certain, you know, litigations. Um, what are some of the things that you have found out as a researcher? Thank you, Ayola. Um, one thing I will say is uh, I wrote this in my column uh, last uh, Sunday in the Nations that really we have problems with the present political parties. Um, APC, PDP, I mean, the most popular political parties, uh, and others. Why? Because there are no clear ideas, ideologies, identities, and inclusivity. Mm. Now, when we talk about going back to the Second Republic... Just me, before you go okay. there, you talked about inclusivity. Yeah. In what way? Um, when we talk about that, because this is, these are part of the reason why nations fail. And our nation is just almost getting there, socially, economically, politically, and anyway. Inclusivity is about, you know, really bringing in to board all people, all people of very uh, professions, background, and the rest, from all nook and cranny of the country, so that they are together in making decisions in the way the party is run. You can see in the two parties now, impunity. Well, you, you speak, are you a lawyer? I'm not, oh, okay. but, but I'm a researcher. <laughs> just, Give it to me that I'm a researcher, so just, I read widely. Just <laughs> wanted want, want to clear that out. <laughs> well, Dr. Tanko, um, you would know why some of these things happen. I mean, being a politician yourself and having contested at various levels. What are some of the things that you think could be responsible for this Crisscrossing. Uh, there are those who have crossed to one party and then crossed back to where they are coming <laughs> from and stuff like that. So, uh, in, in terms of you know, reasons, what would you adduce or uh, as a reason this could be happening? Okay. Um, first of all, let us make a very clear view. We have a very flawed legal framework called the Electoral Act. The Electoral Act is supposed to be uh, a kind of a pillar that defines how political contest and all is being established in the country. When the pillars is fundamentally flawed, what you have is what you are seeing as of today. 
We had an electoral act at a point in time which give room that if there is a faction being created within a party, individuals can move from one political party to another without any form of punishment. Mm -hmm. And that gives room for this particular flagellism from and then uh, uh, political nomadism from one political party to another. We have conversed for a very long time, stating that that is fundamentally wrong. And the Electoral Act must clearly stipulate that once you move from one political party, you have a right to move from political party to political party, but there must be a kind of a reason when you move, you must pay the, the due punishment for moving from one political party to another. That will have deter people from moving from one political party to another. But that is not done. And that's the reason why majority of all will call for Mr. Call on Mr. President to hold on to his assent on this particular electoral act because we need to clear the system and make sure that the system is equitable, preferable, and acceptable to all. Let me also make this particular very clear uh, position. It is important for people to know Anybody that is joining a political party or a group of people must know these three, must be, uh, must be abreast with three, these three documents or four documents. One, the constitution of the, uh, Nigeria. Two, the constitution of the party. Three, the electoral act. And four, the guidelines that ensure the political parties. If you are not well grounded with these facts, you will also, you may end up going into a political party without knowing actually what the rudiments are. Of course, there are issues like the a manifesto of a political party and the rest of them. I give a clear example. For the party like mine, who is National Conscience Party, many people, when they saw me running for an election as a presidential candidate at the same time, the chairman of the party, people questioned it and said, no, why can you have the same two things at the same time? But the party was trying to encourage people to run, members of the party to run for election. That way, encouraging internal movement from the party. But if you don't know this coming out from outside, you would think probably one is usurping his own power. But that is not, that's not the, the, the fact about it. So these are facts you need to know. As a political uh, uh, interested person, you must know the, the rules and regulation within the party and so that you will be able to, whenever you run into the party, you'll be able to run within the ambience of law and order. So as it is today, major problem we have is the legal framework which give room for people to run from one political party to another without recourse to any kind of punitive measures as against them. If now, that is done, maybe we'll have a better system. Well, to, let's explore that a little further. Is there something that made that come to be in the first place? I mean, I would have expected that if the, pact, if the parties had unique identities, a unique philosophies, that wouldn't even be something that anyone would want to encourage. What kind of recommendations should have been in, in that law that should have maybe forbidden one person from moving from one party to another? Because we have heard over and over again a number of people say, look, when you move from one party to the other, as an elected official, you should, you know, you should abdicate your role. You should, you should vacate your office. But that hasn't been happening. Is that the kind of thing that, that, that kind of a recommendation you are looking to? No. I, we support strongly the idea that if you run on a platform of a party, you have the manifesto which you sell. I, I've always been arguing with a lot of people who say most of the political parties in Nigeria do not have ideology at, as of today, but that's not true. It is important to note that all the political parties derive their manifestos from, their, from chapter two of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. It was carved in such a way that everybody will pick from that particular chapter two and make its own identity known. So every political party, as you are seen, has its own identity, has its own principle. But the fact is that whether it advances it or sell it, or that is the cardinal point you use in campaigning for election, is another different thing entirely. So as of today, what we have is that People take manifestos of one political party, run for election, win election with that manifesto, and then after they've won, they will not just position that particular uh, uh, manifesto and go into another political without abdicating their seat, without selling another new manifesto. So we advocate that if you are moving from a party, we didn't stop you, move but abdicate your seat, sell another manifesto to the people, because what you are selling to the people is the social contract between yourself 
and the people. But if you run away from that particular social contract which you've already sold to them, and then you are taking another one, then it is very, very important for you to put up another, uh, the manifesto of the party and sell again to the people. So when you abdicate your seat, if you are popular, you will win. If you are not popular, at least you, then the next person will take over with a new manifesto. That is how it is done in a very standard democracy around the world. And many of the political parties that you are seeing that have not, uh, you are calling them mushroom political party or smaller political party, have suffered this particular situation. We suffered the same thing in Ekiti. We won the state, state, uh, state House of Assembly, and at the same time, that person left us and joined PDP, and there was no punitive measures, and then we were deregistered because of that particular situation. That is unacceptable. That is no way to grow a party. That is not a way to grow internal democracy. In fact, what it does is that it kills the morale of the younger political party who are aspiring to be a bigger political party. If we have done so long okay, before Okay, Dr. Tanko. Okay, Dr. Tanko. Let me bring in Mr. Buhari at this point. Let me speak from the point of view of the electorate now. So, let's, let me paint this scenario. You join the PDP. You... Uh, campaign on that party platform. You win the election. And then a few months down the line, you move to the APC. Maybe in my area, we are a PDP people and we voted for you, not because of you, but because of the party on which platform that you, you, you contested on. So you have left us in the lurch now by moving to the APC. You are representing us we don't know too much about the APC. We voted for you because we understand the workings of the PDP. But now you have run away. What happens to us who voted for you? Like we have seen many times um, how it happens with the electorate. The moment that particular candidate moves from that PDP party to an APC party, what we've seen happen is the entire electorate, the entire district, the entire community moves with that person to the other party. And that is why we keep saying we have a fundamental problem with how we identify ourselves with this party. So I think what the electorate really pays attention to is whoever we have voted for, where does he want us, what, where does he want us to go to? You hear people say things like, we haven't decided which party we're going to vote for because our leader has not told us which party we would vote for. So there are people who have positioned themselves in the society that will tell their, their followers or their people that I haven't decided yet which party we're going to support. When I make that decision, then we can all move to that party. So again, um, when we look at all of those things, I know a lot of complaints come to the politicians, how they run their affairs, how they do the things that they do. But in most cases, I actually find faults also with the electorate and how they have been unable to stand their grounds to make sure that the people that have, they have elected into political offices, you know, respect them, obey them, and do exactly what they have promised to do for them. Because what we've seen clearly is the people are always quick to follow certain individuals just because they believe those are the people that can actually direct them around the political space. Mr. Buhari, therefore, is that in this country, most, um, most of us, the electorate, vote for the persons, not for the party. So wherever he says we should go, we go. In most cases, they vote for the party and the, the, the individual. But, uh, you know, when that individual owns the power, when that individual is seen as being in control of that space, the people just listen at that point. They are unable to now stand their ground to say, you know what, you have actually betrayed us, and for those reasons, we are going to stand against you. Check out all the people that have defected from one political party to the other. 90% of the time, you see the entire people in droves move to the new political party that this person has asked them to move to. And this yeah. is the situation on ground. This is the reality. And so when we try to make comparison with our political space and the political space in other climates, I say to everybody, this is the Nigeria political space. Let us deal with it. But fundamentally, I think one thing that is very important for us to do is to make sure that the internal political party structures and, and happenings are designed in such a way that they do not just make the political parties strong, but prepare the political parties to be um, sufficient enough to meet with the requirements of the Nigerian people. So that at the end of the day, we're talking about political parties that have been designed in such a way that because things are working right interna internally in the parties, it actually translates to better governance, it tr actually translates to um, 
ways that the dividends of democracy can reach the people. Otherwise, we would be having political parties that are just there to win elections and everybody goes home. Okay, Dr. Yeah. Um, should there, do you think there should be stringent penalties for people who cross carpet? Should the parties themselves put up stringent um, rules to deter people from crossing carpet, from defecting, so that if there are enough penalties, and if those penalties are strong enough, it will deter them from going. Because if, for instance, they say, if you go, you give up the position, because you got that position on our platform. Mm. If you go, you have to give up that platform. Yeah, I believe there should be a penalty, stringent one, because we have been having this running uh, you know, from time to time. And like, you know, the, the first person that spoke uh, made Dr. mention Tango. of... Yes, mm. Dr. Tanko made mention of Ikiti State. That's my home state. And uh, I knew NCP won that state assembly election. You see, but the question is, did the party, NCP, did they go to court? There is a need. I've been thinking about this. There is a need for parties to test the law. about you know, Because there was no faction in NCP. So why should that candidate go? So... And apart from that, uh, what we are saying, uh, the parties themselves should have stringent uh, 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 penalties, mm -hmm. sanctions in place but, in their So they should not wait for INEC. The parties for INEC, themselves. the law that the, the Dr. Tanko just quoted says, I mean, according to him, the Electoral Act says it's not against the law. If there's a faction. But even that, that is why the electoral has to be revisited. I remember, you see, most of the things that the wranglings on the electoral was about electoral voting, electoral transmission. You see, but there are still some salient issues. You see, especially like this, cross-carpeting. Look at what is happening now in Cross River with Professor Ben Ayadi. Now, uh, 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 the second speaker that spoke uh, was saying that uh, when you move, then your electoral will understand. You can, you can look at the spate of resignation. Some people that were, you know, they just left the government in Cross River. The next election, the centre will not hold. Go and mark my word there. But, you know, before we get to that in the next election, <laughs> while the centre is still holding, um, uh, they, it is disturbing that we're talking about internal party democracy. Yeah. The internal democracy within the particular the party. party yes. In your opinion. I mean, if it wasn't wrong, you wouldn't want to get out of that party to another one, which may or may not be burning as well. Within the party, yes. there is a lot of wrangling, yeah. especially the leading parties. Yes. For you, yeah. and from your findings, yeah. what are the issues? Now, Ayola, there are two perspectives. If I'm a member of a party, I mean, a political party shifting, I am not elected. You see, we have to put this in context and in perspective. I'm elected based on social contract. Now, he was talking about, uh, Dr. Tango was talking about manifesto. Now, I, I sold some things to the people. They believe in me. They bought it. We wind it together to do some things for them. And suddenly, I could see some internal wrangling in my party. And no, then no, no, that, that, that's the question. That's the question. Just before the jumping ship, what are the things that cause that internal wrangling? That, I mean, we're human beings, there will always be quarrels. But... What, why is it that there are, it's not so easy to resolve those issues as a party where we have the, the same, we're supposed I will, to have a united I will, I will answer opinion? Now, it talks about ideology. <laughs> that, that was why I was going back to Memory Lane, the Second Republic. You see, when we have, we have this, uh, we have UPN, the Union Party of Nigeria, we have MPP and all the rest of the APN. You see, we knew, the people knew what this party stands for. We knew the, it's a brand. It's like, you know, Toyota. You know Volkswagen now, you know Toyota, you know Dassun. You see, they are brand. We don't have our political party as brand yet. And this politician must know the reality. Whosoever they are, they are acting out of impunity. They don't even follow the constitution. Look at what is happening in APC now. It's like seeing an open dish. And all of you, you are working to it. You know, and you have sons in your party who are ministers, who are governors. You know, you have sons. So we are not a lawyer. And you can see this thing. And you are walking into it. And that was how they lost rivers. <laughs> they didn't have any kind of river. Sampara is there. You know, they lost out. You see, which other state again? Look at what's happening in Sampara now. With the governor crossing to APC. And the deputy saying, I am not going anywhere. Because 
We won this. It was a technical. It was APC that won the election. Really, the election. It was technically that PDP court awarded it to PDP, and that was why the PDP deputy governor uh, is saying, "I'm not leaving the party. I will stay." And it's already a debacle there in that state. So the the, the electorate should be strengthened. Number one, the political the political parties themselves should have penalties in place. Okay. Well, uh, Mr. Abu Especially for elective. For people on elective uh, uh, platform, because okay. you have a contract with the people at the okay. same time. Well, let me let me ask me, Mr. Buari. Do you think we have a, a, a system in our polity, in in our political system, in the uh, to use the words of uh, one policy in a political industry? Do you think we have a system that can discipline politicians? Oh yes, there are, there are systems that can discipline politicians. Yeah. Uh, I belong to a group called the Progressive Youth Movement within the APC, and this is a group that we have put together that encourages, um, that tries to see how we can encourage more young people to get involved in the National Working Committee, to get more young people believing in the system, to bring, inject new ideas into the space. But you see, the problem with our internal political democracy is that any time a, so to see a, a, a faction or a group of people are seen to be a, 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 having a different opinion from whatever it is that the larger house has. You are seen as an opposition, you are seen as you have been sponsored, or you are seen as um, somebody who just wants to cause trouble. But you see, the, the beauty of, of democracy is that we will always have divergent views. We will always have views from different angles. And this is like my friend, uh, Dr. Tonko, would say. It's like free consultancy. By the time you have people that are coming with different views to you, it means that they're actually telling you that there's something, there are some things that we should pay attention to so that you do not make mistakes, so you can get things right. But we, we have constantly seen that one of the reasons why we've been having the issues within the APC party is because some people have actually highlighted some of the things your guests in the studio has, have highlighted. When we look at the Ondo uh, rulings, the four to three judgment from the judges, clearly it goes to show that, look, for if any other thing must have happened, we probably would have had a, a, a loss of um, the Ondo gubernatorial uh, seats. You know? And people are just saying, we are pushing caution in the air to make sure that we do not make mistakes. Many people have interpreted the situation from different angles. I am saying that whatever the case is, we have an interim uh, caretaker committee chairman who is doing fantastically well. We've seen people that come from other political parties well, into Mr. the Buhari, APC. You're, you're, not, you're not quite addressing the question that I asked. My apologies. Some of these internal my apologies. Have got to do with how prepared. My, my apologies. You're not particularly addressing the question that I want you to, uh, to answer. I know that there are times when there is what they call anti-party activities. And that, for the life of me, could be interpreted to be absolutely anything, including breaking a teacup. So now, <laughs> is there a system in a political party, in the APC, for instance, beyond this anti-party activities thing, that says, no, you're out of line. Get back on line. This is what the party stands for, so that there is that unity of purpose among the parties, as opposed to everyone pitching their camps and uh, pitching their tents. Of course, there are disciplinary actions. Of course, there are reconciliation committees. And of course, there are people who get expelled from the party, get suspended from the party based on their activities. But you see, the thing that can create that unity you spoke about is the leadership willing to listen to the people, the leadership willing to carry the people along, the leadership willing to sit down and say, okay, what are your grievances? Let's talk about them. I mean, as a leader, the, the last thing you should do is to actually think that you're larger than the people. They have entrusted you with that position and you, you're expected to bring yourself down to them and listen to them only so that you can have all of them in the same place with you. I mean, the worst thing that we can you, you can do as a leader is to say you want to control the people who are not ready to be with you on the same path. Where are you going to take them to? Who are, who's going to be following behind you? So again, uh, you spoke about the unity, you spoke about the disciplinary action, or whether we have um, measures in place that can actually deter people from actually leaving political parties. Of course there are. We've actually seen people expelled. At the same time, some political parties um, are scared of actually touching certain individuals because they believe that there are huge 
uh, individuals, for example, uh, a governor has won a political uh, a seat in a, in a state, and then you are now telling him that um, you want to suspend him from the party. You don't want to suspend him. You want him to remain in the party with you because you believe he already has a, a, a seat that he has won in your party. But then he's a PDP governor, and he's deciding he's going to move to the APC. What do you want to do? You want to suspend him? You want to expel him? Whatever you want to do, he doesn't care. He moves to wherever he wants to move to. Dr. Sanko. Um, I don't know if you have noticed that most defections are into the ruling party. <laughs> Why do you think this happens? Wouldn't you rather stay in your party and become a formidable opposition party? We don't see that happening for in the United States, for instance. Okay, the Republicans lost the election in the last elections, but they're still in their party. And they're doing all they can to be a formidable opposition party. Interestingly, what really happened is just about greed, uh, self-serving, and looking for a greener pasture to continue to move, jumping like a monkey, forgive me for using that word, from one tree to another because this particular tree is not fruitful. We are going to the next one which is fruitful. That is the reason why majority move at will. And as I just, as I've said earlier on, there is no punitive measure. So people just go in and you saw people who are patient enough in that party and take over their position. And, and that's what we have seen over the years. Because when you move, it's either you have, uh, uh, have an issue that you want to protect yourself and come into another political party so that you can be protected. Or you want to move because you feel that you are not being, things are not happening in your older political party and then you want to go into where the, the, the food is cooked. And, and those are some of the problems that we have seen over the years because people are not moving because of integrity or because of building the party. They are moving in because they are looking out for something that they can benefit themselves personally, not the interests of the people in which they govern. So this is basically true. And the truth about it is that the fundamentals are flawed, completely wrong. Way back then in the, uh, uh, in the Second or Third Republic, what we usually have is that there is a little, little, little comfort in the society. Majority of people are, can take care of their, they can eat three square meal. So they own the party. What I mean by ownership of the party is that as of today, very few members pay membership dues into a political party. So they don't own the party. They don't own the party. The few that own the party are either those who are in legislative offices, who are governors, or who, president, or ministers. Those ones are the ones who are contributing heavily to the survival of the party. So they tend to dictate the pace in the party. So they say, he who pays the piper dictate the tone. So they control the apparatus of the party. So going out of the party become a difficult thing. Sometimes they look at it as if I'm going out, I'm going with my, with my acquired wealth as against the interest of the party. People will try to find a way of bringing them down. Even the chairman of the party, even the chairman of the party is being looked at as if it's a niche, is benefiting from the largesse of what people contribute. And that is why it's so easy for a chairman of a political party to be removed from, from, from position of, uh, of power, even when his tenure is not being, uh, has not expired, because he doesn't control the finances of the party. There are people who control the, the finances of the party. You have the godfathers, you have the infathers, you have the women fathers, you have the young fathers who have money. And they have put so much money into the party that if they, don't, if they say one thing, you as a chairman will be jittery. And that's not supposed to be. But if the people own the system, they are the ones that contribute to the survival of the party. They pay their membership due. They, they speak at will. They say what is right. Putting the right peg in the right hole. Then you will see the system moving in. And of course, every political party has its punitive measures. And that punitive measure would be administered. Had it been that there are punitive measures for people who move from one party to another. You will have seen the reduced the reduce rate of how people move from one party to another. But because there are no punitive measures, people move at will. And so it is easy for anybody to take 
Just just one second. Of one party to another one. Just one second. That can what you just said now cannot happen because you are the one who quoted the law that says, you know, the people have the right to move willy nilly. They can go to any party at any time. And you come know, back and whenever. Come back. It's like you go to to this <laughs> mo to market and come back and just you know stuff like that. But the question that I want to ask you, uh, and maybe that's let's just hope that the president is considering that it, the issue, just as you have said. But both of you, uh, uh, Mr. Buhari and yourself, Dr. Tanko, have spoken to the fact that there are superpowers, so to speak, in political parties. Mm -hmm. um, so. Can we then say that they are political parties when there are certain individuals that seem to be bigger than the, than the party? Because, I mean, that's the sense I make of what you've just said. Of course. Uh, going back to what you said, Anna, yes, the law says that you cannot impugn on somebody from moving from one party to another. You cannot. But at the same time, there must be some punitive measures for you if you move, there are people you meet on the queue. They are there waiting. You can't just come in and then the laws will give, the party will put in place and the electoral act will put in place. Say, look, if you are moving into another party, you can move, but then you cannot just take the platform. That's the key important thing. Somebody has been wanting to run for a governor. For years he's been queuing. Then because you have money and you just come and take over that particular platform, how do you expect him to feel? And how do you expect that there will not be internal wrangling within the party? There definitely will be. People will work against the person who come and just take this ticket without, just in the middle of the night. That's just what I'm saying. Okay. So, but you can move. But you cannot just but, come but and just take up the ticket. Tango. There must be, you must follow the line and people who have killed for a long time. And then for the reason, the issue of uh, saying that people uh, uh, run away and then feeling uh, uncomfortable or having issues or the party having issues. You see, the internal party mechanism must work at we at the proper time. You don't allow things to stay for a very long time. When there are issues within the party, you raise that issue and you deal with it immediately. Once you deal with it immediately, it gives confidence within the electorate, it gives confidence within the members of the party, it gives confidence within the entire system of the party. But if you allow it to linger for so long, it becomes a bigger wound that it becomes difficult for, people, for leadership of the party to deal with. So in a party ma management, you must be able to find a way of carrying everybody along. Even those who become like uh, um, godfathers, they come in. If you have rules and regulation and you put it on ground for them to know that because you come in because you have large money and all, it doesn't mean that you can usurp leadership of the party. It doesn't mean that you can take up candidacy of the party. It doesn't mean that you can determine who become who in the party. Once these ground rules are being mentioned, I can tell you most of the godfathers who move from one party to another will find it difficult to move because they know that there are rules and regulations. What we are having here is that we've polarized the system, we've allowed the electoral act to be put into a lot of questions where you open the door and say if there are factions, people go into a political party and create factions so that they can be able to take advantage of it. We need to take care of this. We need to clean that electoral act. We need to clean it in such a way that people will feel comfortable. And here, please, I want to advise that whatever things that we do, okay. it is not for ourselves alone. Okay. It is for the uh, Dr. Tanko, ju ju many just one second. There, there are many, many of these issues that you have raised, exactly. one that you haven't spoken to, but we'll come back to the, some of them. Now, uh, Dr. Kundayo, yeah. uh, the, the problems are not just going to go away. We have to deal with them one way or another. Uh, one of the things that makes this conversation in particular interesting for me is that uh, unless the internal workings of a political party are admirable mm. and enticing, mm. truly well-intentioned people may not come into the parties. Mm. And consequently, well-intentioned people may not come into governance. How mm. do we deal with this? That's really, uh, for me as a followership researcher, it, it's, it's a thing that I bother my head on because I look at, just like, uh, you know, uh, Pastor Tony Bakari had to say one time, you know, the worst of us are ruling the best of us. And that is it because the real people we have uh, uh, who are elites, who are well read, who are professionals, they are not coming to the mainstream of politics because they look at the parties, they are the same. APC, PDP, whatever NCP, they are the same. So, because 
they have not been able to. Well, Dr. Tango spoke about they have ideas, they have ideology. They have in paper. It's a paper tiger. You see, like I said the other time, using the you know uh, uh, automobile. Toyota, you know Toyota is Toyota. You know Volkswagen is Volkswagen. You know that's one is Nissan. You know you know the brand. You see, we have not really the um, um, political parties. We can't see the. They, we can't see the thick line in between them. The lines are even broken. They are fainted, kind of. You see, so as long as followers begin to watch this, like you said, you see. But what can be done is let the people come together. Which, which people? The followers, Electorate. you and I, mm. we can come together. It may not mm. be in the name of a party, Ayola. You know, I, I wrote this in my column last Sunday. Let's come together. You see, just like we have uh, social parapol, social association, right. it will be a political pressure group. Mm. And then the politicians will respect us. Okay. We have our PBC, we just tell them, look, these are mm. things we want. Mm. And there are, when well, you know the people talking there, they are professors, they are doctors, they are engineers, they are lawyers, you see, they are IT gurus, they are businessmen and women. And they, they just say, well, look, these are the things we want. And they know the number that they control. Because democracy is a game of number. But politicians know that you and I, most of us, we not even come out. We are there are parties there, the docility is there. No, but Dr. Dr. Ekunayo, don't do you not think that that is changing? You know, when Dr. Tanko was talking, out, my mind went back to what um, Dr. Pat Utomi, Professor Pat Utomi, went through during mm. the last elections when yeah. he wanted to be governor of Delta <laughs> State. I mean, this kind of group you are talking about would be something that would appeal to him, for instance, because he has gone through the normal, normal, in parenthesis, um, process. Mm. And he saw that even before he was able to locate his um, polling station or wherever, the elections were over. He wasn't even able to vote. And he was in the election. He was a candidate in the election. <laughs> I mean, that experience is something that every Nigerian should look at and say, do I really want to join one of these big parties? Is it really worth it for me? Or should I join one of the smaller parties and try to grow those parties if they see that internal democracy is actually working in those small parties? I, I agree with you, Auntie Alero, because, you know, like the former uh, president, uh, uh, Olusha Gwambasanjo, was calling for a third force. Now, I align with that, but not as a political party, I will still say. Now, if there have been a, a, a group of people like that. We all know the values, the virtues that Professor Patu told me stand for, and I've been standing for all these years, that mostly will have been, uh, these people, we all, we all vouch for him, and that can make us to vote if I'm in his constituency. If other people can just come and say, ah, this man is coming up, now let's do the needful. But then there is this thing that most of our followers, you know, they are still, do I, I will say that. And that is why you see, like, uh, this last uh, uh, local government election in Lagos, I read something which is very interesting. A particular uh, ward, a candidate came to that ward and brought in 500 AULTW members, mobilized them to come. And then, don't need the answers. The youth are everywhere. We will burn this. We will burn this. <laughs> you are not starting. When my daughter joined, I said, look, you are wasting your time. You see, all ended in waste. The politicians know how to neutralize you. You see, because at the end of the day, you are not coming, you are not coming under any banner. You are not having any political pressure group. Talk less of a party. So it's a waste. You see, and as long as we have things like this, but politicians know those people to face. Yeah. The market men and women, the mechanics, the artisans, no, they, they don't go to them. You spoke of a third force, a pressure group. Yes. But in our constitution, if you want to contest, you have to contest on the platform of a political party. So if your pressure group is not a political party, forget it. So to what end would you be setting up that pressure yeah, group? Yeah, I, I will tell you this, Auntie Alero, and uh, I, will, I will give you an instance where this happened in history, in, in the, uh, 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 we refer to in followership studies. Now, when you have people like this who are politically conscious, they will teach themselves, they will educate themselves, and the politicians are afraid when they see followers coming together. And they know that a change is looming. One thing that could happen is they could approach you. 
What is it that you want? Kill and Fegan, what do you want? Okay, we want one of us to be back. No, that is the way. It's because if you just sit down there, they are not bad. I mean, they are this, they are that. They will keep, we keep on in this recycling of, you know, dealership as we call it leadership. It's, it will keep on happening. Now, the, the example I want to give is in Germany. We read this in followership studies. You know Adolf Hitler started as a follower? He was not even a member of the Labour Congress executive. He was just a member of uh, a worker. And then he started speaking. One follower. The power of one follower. That's why I call it. He started speaking. And when they could say, ah, this voice is becoming stronger, the Labour Union, you know, they say, ah, Oh, you throw him, you, you can be part of our executive. And he led the labor union you know, of Germany. You can, you can Google it. He led them. And when he started speaking to power in that country, they formed a political party. And the party won. And that was how Adolf Hitler became the, the head of that country, the chancellor. And we, as, we, as we often say, the rest is history. Yes. <laughs> but that history. Oh, no, no. Well, let, let me ask you, uh, Mr. Buhari. Um, uh, we're, we're, we're drawing close to the end of this segment now, but uh, you're a young man, and generally, you know, young people don't really like it when uh, it's not really working the way it ought to work. They will speak. Uh, people so, don't okay. have that patience for <laughs> nonsense, if I can use that term. How do you see young people who are not members of any political party now, coming in to make any significant difference when the internal workings of a political party are the way they are right now? Thank you. Um, I think this is important that we talk about very clearly. We, I belong to the progressive youth movement. And what we have said to every young person in this country is stop standing on the sidelines believing that the political parties are corrupt. Stop standing on the sidelines believing that the political parties do not have ideology. You have something to offer, you have something to give, come into these political parties, come in your droves, come in your numbers. Look, elections are only being manipulated because both candidates or the closest candidates are always very neck to neck with each other. So you can actually manipulate certain things and actually get a winner. But I'm telling you, if we can come in of overwhelming numbers and sit within these political parties and say no, we're not going to let it happen the way you want it to happen. We are members of this party and we insist for it to be like this. Otherwise, we go into a vote. After it's a democracy. But what you see young people do is they stand on the sidelines. And, and, and I disagree with Dr. Okunda. Well, one second, uh, one second on that issue. No. One second on that issue. You heard, you spoke about it the other time. No. Just one second, just one second. Just one second. You spoke about it the other time that some, sometimes, Powerful individuals within the political space, within the political party, influence things. What is it that you think? I mean, is it difficult for any of these powerful persons, the power perhaps being money, do you see any of them not being able to buy over some of these young people that you're talking about? How, how much does it take? $5,000 each person? Ayola, who, who's going to buy me? That's the truth. And there are many like myself. There are many young people that gathered in Oba the last time that we could see that nobody could possibly buy. What are these people doing outside the space? They run businesses. Their businesses are only going to survive if they truly have a, a, a political structure or a political system or a government that is actually going to stand in their favor. We are, what we are saying is clear. I also agree with uh, Dr. Tony said there is a queue. Look, there are different things that political parties look for especially when it comes to how they want to uh, cling to victory. When you want to cling to victory, some of the things you're looking at is, how do I possibly get the candidates that, is going, that are going to sway the people? In every community you go to, there are popular people. You can actually say, uh, swear an individual and say, come to our party, you have the popularity, you have the know-how, you're a great person, you just are not to the right party. If this party is going to say, okay, fine, we're going to give you a platform for you to contest, he moves to that party and is able to win the primaries, but why not? After all, there is, there is a structure called the primary election within the political parties that can actually help you become the flag bearer of that party depending on the, on the seat you're running for. So what we're saying in essence is this whole mentality of oh, there is a queue, go and follow the queue, are part of the problems that these political parties are facing. You sh it should be a level playing field 
Whether you came in yesterday or today, the most important thing is, as the fact that you have become a member of a political party, you are free to contest for any political position within that party. And the apparatus that have been put in place by that political party are the apparatus that would actually help determine mm. if mm. you win a, a particular seat within the primary election to determine okay. whether you will now go ahead and actually contest for the for the general election. Okay. We're, we're, to every young we're, we're out of time. We we're, can actually we're, we're running out of we time. Numbers, Just a we second. We're running we out of time. We have, we have run out of time. <laughs> completely <laughs> run out of time, Mr. Buhari. But um, let me give um, Dr. Tanko 10 seconds to speak to the politicians who are strong and on the ground. What do they need to do to strengthen internal politics? Well, they should just stop usurping the powers of the members of the party. And when I said queuing, because people have there work, work so tirelessly, and you come because you have money and then you just take over their position, it's not it is money. not good. It is not good. It is unacceptable in any democratic standard. All right, well, then, clearly, uh, both finally, of you, both of you like are politicians, and you know exactly what you're talking it's about. Exactly. It's a for or against it's thing right. between the two of you, so it's well, well understood and well appreciated. But for now, we have to thank you very, very sincerely for being a part of our conversation this morning. Dr. Yunus Atanko is Chairman of National Conscience Party, as well as Ahmed Buhari, a former presidential candidate and member of the APC, who who joined us from our studio in Abuja. Uh, we also have had Dr. John Ekundayo, who is a leadership researcher. Thank you very thank much you, for you your very time much. this morning. Thank you. So, we continue after now with another issue. Do stay with us. <laughs> Thank you for staying with us. Yes, we're going to be talking waste management in Lagos State. Lagos State huh, <laughs> has an estimated population of 24 million. Yes. Whoa. That's what I said. 24 million. And and one guess family. What? <laughs> it grows every day. <laughs> <laughs> so you can imagine the volume of waste that is generated by 24 million people. Well, well over the years, Lagos State has uh, changed from one system to the other. It's trying out all kinds of systems to try and make sure that the city is not the dirtiest city in the world, which it was tagged some years ago. Mm -hmm. It was d tagged the dirtiest capital city in the world. Um, Maybe we are shedding that uh, appellation right now, but um, we have the managing director of the Lagos Waste Management Authority, Loma, with us in the studio. It's my pleasure to welcome Ibrahim Odumboni. Good, Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, ma. Thank Good morning, you for sir. joining us. Thank you. Welcome. Maybe I should begin by asking you, how easy is your job? <laughs> Ooh, very interesting. You look very young <laughs> to be in that seat, so you must have the solutions. That's why you're there. I think it goes back to what you said that Lagos is trying different things, so I'm, probably, I'm one of the trials, and I think it's working well for Lagos. Okay, okay. So, so what did you bring to the table? So for myself, I bring uh, a lot of uh, knowledge, business acumen, seeing things in terms of sustainability, more about innovation, mm -hmm. and thinking ahead for the future. Okay. So, you know, I connect with the generation, each of the generation, and that the older generation or the middle generation. Generation, generation y next. Well, y, <laughs> X, and Z. So it's most important now. Like you said, waste management in Lagos is a, is an enormous task. Mm -hmm. The population continues to increase, and we estimate that an average person in Lagos will do a minimum of 0 0.69 kg of waste per day. So that comes about with that number. And that's why we say we have about 13,000 metric tons on a daily basis yeah. as a BRS minimum. And the challenges continue to grow. But for us, a day is never the same. So today is different from tomorrow. And every hour is different. Mm. I, 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 I jokingly asked you before we came on air, 
anything for the boys. I do that all the time. And he said, waste for the boys. <laughs> <laughs> so let's just be clear about that one. There's <laughs> waste too well, sir. He might take give you well, waste. He might give you some around. waste to make, your, make some wealth. Waste. You, you can no, make wealth, wealth out of, waste. of it. Uh, no. I know you have to create the oh, wealth you yourself. Here, <laughs> well, um, just don't, don't answer your... that question yet. Don't answer the question yet because. I don't know whether you are about to cross carpet into another political party right now. No, no, no chance. <laughs> no, well, no chance. But so, I'm uh, right here. I, I wanted to, to ask you, perhaps the challenge of dealing with it, on the one hand, it is a problem. On the other hand, it is an opportunity. Okay. So if you say waste for the boys and it's supposed to be wealth, try to give perspective as to how people can own the process so that they also can join in the efforts to help your job. Because and unless that, wealth exactly unless that perspective is known, I think the problem is there. I think it goes back to the initial question you asked that what do I bring to the business? So I was an I'm an investment banker by trade coming into waste. So for me, investment you, banker. Yeah. So well, you came to invest turning, wastefully. You could, with, with that, <laughs> what that gives you is give you a wealth of knowledge where you can actually turn anything to value. It's value creation. So one of the support that we've got in terms of creating waste to wealth and value from we from waste is, if you could remember very well, in, in on the fifth of September two thousand and nineteen, Governor Babaji Somolu launched the Blue Box Initiative. Which has now evolved into what we call Lagos Recycle. So before that time, recycling in Lagos was pretty much very informal. But now it's quite informal, and we have between about 6,000 plus youths gainfully employed, both formally and informally, in that sector. And the volume of our recyclers have gone from 2 to 57 as we speak, mm. and that number is growing. And what that does is the off takers that we have in the recycling business. We used to have one or two, now we have a couple more, maybe like 12 now. And that's creating value in there. When you see a, a whole truck full of waste, 25% of what that truck carries is recyclable. And that 25% can be used to make majority of the things that we have on, in our midst now. The chair I'm sitting on is made of a lot of plastic. There's a lot of plastic that is used to produce this. But previously, that's dumped somewhere and nobody cares about it. But now somebody recollects it. The process of collecting it is money for the person collecting it. The process of processing it is money for the person processing it. And the process of turning it into value or something that you can reuse yeah. is money for the industry as well. So that's why we refine two ways to work. And it's one part of the business that for me is canvas. It's something that's not been done before. Yeah. So as we continue to see a development, different things will come into play yeah. and different players will come. So people are encouraged more to invest you don't really need millions to start the business. You can invest by advocate. It could be through advocacy. It could be through collection. I'll give you an example. We have a lady who collects plastic in a Jorah site, a Jorah Lokwa site, and she collects within our community. So you take your plastic to her. She gives you like a, maybe like a, what do you call Congo, like a scoop of rice, and maybe gari or whatever. And over time, she's done that. She's bought a couple of lands that she could do in Ikurudu now. Now she's building a collection center in, and then she has land that she's building her own private residence in, just by collecting plastic. Mm. Okay. So it's only like that, it's, it's value. You say that the number of recyclers has increased to 50, 57. 57 plus. Okay, now what do these recyclers collect to recycle? So they collect things like plastic, glass, Thin, what do they make clothes. them into? What do they make them into? So, for example, plastic can be made into different things. Mm -hmm. So, the cushion inside this is made yeah. of plastic. Uh -huh. Some part of this is polyester, is made into plastic as well. Some t shirts are made into plastic as well. Some of these are made into plastic shares, they are made into casing for your phone, they are made into different things. So, they make them, they use plastic is something that even if, if put under intense temperature, it could show under what we call paralysis, it could turn into something like fuel, refuse derived fuel, 
something nice. I'm used to replace things like diesel or kerosene and coke. Okay. So there's a lot of things you can get by breaking it down. Now, help, help me understand something. Um, you talked about advocacy earlier. Yeah. And um, the way people disperse or uh, waste is troubling. There are some things I, as a person, cannot take. I, I can't stand it, but unfortunately, I'm powerless. You're driving on the road, and you yeah. see an individual in an air-conditioned vehicle, <laughs> fully tinted, rolls down the glass mm -hmm. and throws <laughs> out garbage on the road. That is definitely going to earn us the dirtiest city or one of the dirtiest cities within the shortest possible time. And that trend doesn't seem to, um, to be abating, and it seems we are doing nothing about it. Is, there some, is that something Loma is looking at? So for us, I'm quite, I'm quite conf confident that this current administration will, will see a change to that, because what we've done, we've done a lot of uh, bottom-up approach to revamping of waste by looking at what do we need. You know, in waste collection, there are different modes. You have the generation of waste, you have the separation of waste, you have the collection, you have we'll the disposal come to the and selection, treatment. But is that disposal, so, so the, for the me, way people for do the it? advocacy side, in terms of promoting and letting people do the right behavior, mm. we've gone a lot step further. We've done a lot of advocacy in markets, in public spaces. Then we now observe that, okay, what do we do? Let's go bottom up. So we've gone to primary school through what we created, I, I founded what we call Loma Academy, which is like, because what I, what I discovered is when I came into Loma, you need to have a lot of archive, you need to have an academy, you have to have a lot of practical knowledge. And in the, in the early days for myself, there was nowhere to run to to actually get it, apart from myths, when people tell you, this happens, this happens, this happens. So we now created a school, like a mini academy, mm. where people can go in, so we archive where knowledge, practical, University of Lagos, various universities partners with us. And what we've done now is we've partnered with Subeb, La Subeb, that's Lagos State um, Primary School Board, to make sure that by the time these kids go to the public schools go back to school this September, they will have a primary school, will have waste management incorporated in their, in their curriculum. Yeah. Because what we believe is once, they, once you catch them young, it will continue to grow and they will help us influence the adults as well. Because on the other side, you can look at the enforcement. Advocacy goes with enforcement. You need to let somebody know something is a crime before you start enforcing. Who doesn't know it's a crime to throw garbage out so of the, on the streets? Is, is, a hum, is a human behavior just become a pattern parcel of some of our people? Oh, okay. So you still have to give them a, a, you have to take them to a correction system. And what we do in doing that is we continue to advocate, for example, we go to radio stations, we go to public market, we have an advocacy team that is always out there going around the 377 wards that we have in Lagos to talk to people. Then also we have the law, we have the, enforce, the law of the state that says you can't burn refuse openly. You almost have a bin. My, 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 my apologies, uh, Mr. Roboni. Uh, talk to us about that enforcement. Because yes. I remember, and I hate to make this reference, but um, Alera would also remember you may as well. Between 1983 and 1985, <laughs> there was a government in power that initiated what they call why war against in indiscipline. indiscipline. Yes, this the government of Lagos State tried to restart it with kick against, kai, kick against indiscipline. One of the core elements of those policies was waste disposal yes. by our people, and. But unfortunately, enforcement, which was strong in the 80s and strong during the, when Kai was initiated, has completely, you know, gone to the winds, so to speak. Yeah. So who is supposed to champion this, this enforcement and how is it being done? So, and when are they going to start? Because so I'll, I'll, I'll tell enforcing? you that yep. it's already started and we've seen the rejuvenation of Kai. So Kai used to exist, and um, they do a very good job. So now the administration of Gomorrah Desonwolu, through the Ministry of Environment, led by Mr. Tunji Bello, have revamped Kai. So we have Kai back, but now they are being given the right tools. So last week, uh, this week, when we're launching our commission in our truck, the governor also launched what we call the, the City Monitor app. 
the city monitor app can be downloaded on google play store on apple store as well for any residents of lagos city, and you can, monitor. city monitor app. okay so you can use it to report any infractions so for kai they are everywhere in lagos but at the same time we are working with the uh, ministry of science and tech and transport while they have cameras all across to be able to pick up people that are doing all these infractions but it's very important that everybody collectively contributes to the way we manage uh, our environment because with the environment is what we throw at it that it throws back at us. Uh, uh, Mr. Duboni, yes. um, I am sorry to say that uh, you have not been campaigning your city... CBTT city monitor app, that was launched city, on Wednesday. City. Oh, it's just been launched. Yes, okay, so you, you need see to a campaign media, it. So they're because definitely going to be... If the guy that I was talking about who's winding his window down and yes. throwing trash on, onto the road, if he knows that Ayo has the app and can video him and yes. send it to you, I'm sure he will not be doing that. Definitely. And then for the safety of your street sweepers as well, because sometimes I see the way Lagos drivers drive and I am worried for those women who are sweeping the streets. Sincerely. And I know that you have lost a number of them from people driving carelessly. If we didn't throw so much trash on the roads, you wouldn't need so many sweepers. So, if you, if you campaigned this thing adequately, it will help. and everyone knew about it, because it is, I'm going to throw it, because I know that nothing is going to happen to mm -hmm. me. Somebody's going to sweep it by tomorrow morning. But if we all know that we're all being, the other man is watching you, yeah. you're being monitored, and you can be reported, and you can be disciplined, fined, put in jail for one week or whatever, for that little crime, then I'm sure that the people will it's from going to work. So how much campaigning do you plan? This was only launched on Wednesday, yeah. so it's still early doors. What, what kind of campaign have you planned for I this? I think what we, what, what we have planned for the City Monitor app is kind, is kind of huge in the sense that we're going to go to do a lot of community advocacy around it. There'll be a lot of media. There'll be a lot of uh, radio jingles about it going on as well. And for all the, we, from all the lawman formation, Ministry of Environment formation, we have various agencies under the ministry. We're all going to go all out there to promote it. And like the governor said, it's something that will take us to the next level. Another thing that it will help us, uh, support us do is, we have seen a lot of waste migration. People coming from outside Lagos, from the crannies of Lagos, bringing their waste to the highways. All those things will be dealt with as mm -hmm. well. So for us, the city monitor app, okay. we call it a monitor app, is for people to be able to help us be better, be more proactive, but at the same time, be all, all of us that take responsibility to ensure that we have a consistently cleaner Lagos. Okay, we have found the city monitor, and it says, see it now, report it now. Help fellow citizens stay safe by reporting infractions around you in seconds. And it says next. I'm going to point next and see what happens. <laughs> well, that, that one, while, while that one is happening, <laughs> city in, this, in the app, by the way, just yes. to be clear, is C I T I. Yes. Mm. Not C I T Y. Mm. Um, because the C I T Y is in somewhere in Germany? Yeah. Really <laughs> <laughs> that, that needs to be said. Yes. Okay. Now, so take us through, on, unfortunately, we can't put it on the screen for now, but take us through how people can report with the city monitor app. So with the city monitor app, once you've downloaded it, you mm -hmm. can actually register yourself as a first-time user on it. Mm -hmm. So it's GPS tagged as well. So okay. if you are taking any picture, the location is automatically saved in there. And then you can actually select which local government it is, it relates to. Mm -hmm. If you don't know that, the GPS yourself will pick it up. And then you can put comments in there. There's also a side that you can say you want to be anonymous. So that when it's being reported back at the back end, mm. your name and number is not showing. Okay. But there are times where you don't want to be anonymous. You want to be able to be there to see the process through. And then what will happen is it goes to the back end. Whoever is administering at the back end distributed to the right agency. So it caught, if in the end, this will be able to, um, various agencies, doesn't necessarily mean environment alone will be able to use it. So it reports and it is shared. Then when the job is completed, it marks as completed, ongoing, or in progress, 
and you'll be able to get feedback individually for every infraction you record. I noticed from well, just... Well, IO has registered. <laughs> from just registering, I noticed mm -hmm. that it's also collecting my data. Yes, yeah, so there's a security behind it that just takes it, apart from <clears> you being able to access it, it well, doesn't get... That has yeah. been looked at. Good well. morning, J. Ayo. Think green, think clean, think Lagos. You're the one wearing green, I'm wearing <laughs> Well, that's what your welcome message <laughs> says. Your so, welcome message on City Monitor. Is there, a, is there a particular website that people can get, you know, the... the so these uh, City Monitor app will be available on Lagos State's official website. Mm. It will be available on LOMA website, on all the agencies, on the Ministry of Environment website. Mm. But as we go along, it will be available on all... Lagos uh, agency's website that people can use. Okay. Now, I have seen, um, ju just, just a second, Alero. I have seen it in an iOS device. Yes. Um, is it also a, a, it's on Play Store? Uh, it's Google on Play Store, Store as well. Yeah. The Google, you know, so people yeah. can, can, people can go download look it. for it then. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to report so many people, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay. On, um, well, during sickly. the week, the governor yes. launched some trucks. Yes. Um, what is the position of your PSP collaboration? And are those trucks going to, be going to, are they going to go to PSPs or they'll be operated by LOMA itself? So on, on Wednesday, our governor, Mr. Bajide Songolu, launched uh, 102 waste uh, collection trucks and 100 double dino bins. So the double dino bins are big receptacles for mm. waste. Mm. They're about 16 cubic meter Skips. in capacity. Mm. And they are good for market, public places, public gathering, or areas with loss of human activity. So we need that across, across the state. We currently have over 100, but plus that 100, it actually encourages and speeds up the work we do. Mm. It's more like a static compactor, where a compactor is a moving one. You can take it straight away, but with a... With the double dyno bin, you can go back there and pick it up any time um, at a scheduled time once it's full okay. and move it to the dump site. But with what we have, which is the 102 truck, is completely for the operations of LOMA. So LOMA as a regulator is also taxed with the responsibility of public spaces. So when you enter Lagos, start from your entry and entrance into Lagos, all you see until you go to residential area or commercial places, is LOMA's responsibility. So our PSP, this does not in any way stop our PSP jobs. So the PSP oh, because your PSPs, jobs, they, they, they have to be paid for their services. They have to be paid for their services by tenements and yes. businesses that they are servicing. Yes. So it doesn't stop what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So if you go back to what I said, everyone needs to pay their part. The PSPs are playing a vital part. They've held the state for a very long time. If you could remember very well, something like this was the last done in 2008 when Governor Fashola gave uh, 100 trucks to, to Loma as well. And because of the policy for some assaults that we had in 2015 with the aftermath of Vision Scape and Co. So it's easy to actually destroy, but it's hard to rebuild. But one thing I would say is one step at a time, and we are moving ahead. Yeah. But one thing that this administration of Governor Bajaji is doing is not just building, it's not just rushing to build back. You can rush to build back and buy used compactors. You can rush to build back and buy compactors that are not useful for this terrain. But these are brand new. So these are brand new, De designed in Loma by our engineers, fabricated in Lagos, um, what do you mean, assembled in Lagos, in Oba Akran, in Lagos. Oh. So any of our end technicians can actually mm. put this, these trucks apart. Mm. If there's any troubleshoot on the truck, we can resolve it. And for sustainability as well, there's a three mm. years part warranty agreement with it. So within three years, if anything, apart from tire, diesel and battery, mm. if anything happens to it, the manufacturer will go ahead and, and let the warranty take effect. The, ma the manufacturer the ma in Lagos. In Lagos, which is Dangote, Mesa Dangote Sino truck. Hmm. So it's very important that we promote local content. And even those beans, they were made in our yard in Loma by our technician, getting more weathers across the city, creating more jobs. This truck assembling promoted about 450 new jobs as Mr. Dangote's facility. I, I, I also see that um, there is a website for yeah. the app, CT Monitor. The, these are, okay, these are the new compactor trucks. Wow. Yes. So mm -hmm. that's a double dyno, mm -hmm. and then that was the, we have the, the trucks behind. to pick them up, mm -hmm. and then we have the 
the big mammoth um, garbage trucks. Mm. So we have the big one, which is 24 CBM, that's 60 of them. And then we have the 12 CBM, which is a smaller one, which is 30 of them, and 12 Uklu, that's to carry the bins. I, I Do your incinerators say... still work, the one at um, Ilubiri? Uh, Ilubiri, is, we currently don't have an operating incinerator system. What we have at Ilubiri is a transfer loading station. So it's pretty much like okay. a stopgap. Okay. So in times of... Is it you know, still in use? It's still in use. Very okay, much what in do you use, use it for? Agege. So we have five dump sites in Lagos. Okay. Sometimes with the challenge of traffic, with rain and other things, it could be that there's a queue or there's a delay in getting to the dump site. It goes to that depot. Mm -hmm. You tip them. Okay. In the evening, we pack them through our big trucks, our, our lorries, and then we take them to the dump site. Because the turnaround time of cleaning Lagos is very essential that we move as quickly as we can. Mm. So it's more like a stop gal, pretty much like a depot. Okay. So instead of you going to an NPC to fuel up, you go to a petrol station and fuel up and then that's it. Okay. That's exactly what it is. But in the future, what we've now started doing there is to separate the waste. So whatever is being brought there, we have uh, allocated recyclers at the TLS. Once the waste is tipped, they will remove as much recyclables as they can remove plastic, tin, can, iron, clothes, used material. Mm. They will remove that. And then what we've discovered is, by the time they remove that, only about 60% is left over from what we are taking to the dump site. And that's what we want to encourage. We want to intercept the separation from home. And that's why we bought Lagos Recycle. That's why we have a, a hub called Pakam, where well, Pakam is like an Uber. That's completely for waste Please alone. Spell. P A K A M. It's completely for waste alone. So if you have waste uh, recyclables in your house, that is a bag full, all you need to do is request collection like Uber. The nearest recycler will contact you and they will come and pick it up from Pakam. you. Pakam. Pakam. Come back up. Come yeah, back up. Come and back up. Uh, back up. <laughs> so once they, once they collect it from you, you will automatically be entered into a raffle. We do monetary raffle where we give 100 winners and mm -hmm. uh, 10,000 naira cash price each for using the hat. Okay. So it's something that we continue to promote and then we want to kind of spread it across the. Just, just the you need to one. tell us more about that. <laughs> yes, we What up. kind of stuff can we call Pakam to come and pick up? Yeah, so we have. You can do bottles, glass, glass plastic, plastic. Uh -huh. uh, aluminium, tin, uh -huh. um, iron, used clothes, used shoes. Mm -hmm. Because there's, there's a lot of risk. It's big. It's big recycling for used clothes. Did you see someone How many look at of us have a lot? I you know. see someone look at She's you with one eye. With one eye. <laughs> with one eye, eye. <laughs> About the you the, need pack you need a lot of pack <laughs> maybe like twenty trips. <laughs> okay, well, you know, uh, so Charlie, just a quick one because we're okay. we're running out of time very very okay. quickly. The the smell, yes, when they come from Ojota, not be smarty. Um, are you? I'm, I'm sure you can relate with with the, with that thing, and that's definitely not the only place in the city of Lagos. And you have had complaints about that yes. one. How are you getting ahead of it? So currently, if you drive through uh, the dump site at Ojota, you will notice that we are capping it. So part of the part of the necessary things to do for the engineering the dump site. You remember when your Nigerian son Olu first came in? The first place he visited was Ojota landfill, and that place was in a bad state. So currently, we then instigated that we have to repair all the five dump sites that we have. We had six then. So we repaired five, we shot, we decommissioned one after repairing it, which is the Abuli Egba one. So if you go to Ulushosu now, you see that the roads, the inner roads in there, are now being stabilized. We now have a minimum of four platforms effectively actively working. We have effective six platforms, but we use four and then we reserve two. Mm -hmm. Also, what you continue to see now is when you drive past, you see lots of laterites being poured on the dump sites to cap it, to cover it, so that it can start to regenerate. It can protect the smell so there's no smell coming out because the laterite is covering it. Mm -hmm. Then also, we started using deodorizer where we basically switch the machine on, moving across, and then we do fumigation of the dump site every month mm. as well to mitigate what you as you know raining season 
when it rains, it washes some of it. Then we have to do it. Instead of it doing once a month, in the rainy season, we do it twice a month. Okay. So there's a lot of things going on. But once the capping is done, it will reduce the amount of smell that you get there by a tremendous percentage. Okay. okay. Uh, just a quick one. Um, you will talk us through this Pakam and um, City Money. City Money. Oh, wow. Very, very good. So you're just doing the wealth side of it. <laughs> no, 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 no not, not just that. You see, we, uh, it's disgusting when people who are supposed to know yes. are the ones who litter the place. So okay. talk us through how people can use that app one more time. Uh, by the way, it's not on the Google Play Store yet, but I, say, I see there is a citymonitor.com website. And it's for that same. The city monitor is on the Google Play Store, so I'll try and we'll try I've and make sure we publicize just now. that. Yeah. I haven't seen it. Talk that. us through it again. That, okay, that's the website. That's the city monitor. Yeah, that's how the city the monitor website. website. So yeah. for the city monitor, you need to go onto your phone. When you download it, you can either register by setting up a new profile. You can register through your Facebook. You can register through your phone or your Google Play. That's why you probably got your name straight away. Because mm -hmm. once you put it, it transfers some of the de some of the details, mm -hmm. and then you can make a start. The same thing with Pacam. Pacam app, you can do the same thing. You can download it from iOS Store mm -hmm. or from Google Play as well. Okay. But with that, you register your detail, and every time you need a pickup, you have to specify when you need where you need it to be picked up. And the reason why that is different is because sometimes people move recyclable. You might want to move recyclable in your office. You might want to do the one in your own, yes. but the nearest recycler will come to you. They will weigh it, and then they will tell you where exactly it's going into. And they will tell me how much I'm going to pay. They don't pay anything. No, it's how free. much they're going to pay it's you? Completely free. Oh no, no, you no! no. They, put, they enter you for into a raffle. raffle. No, let, let's let's start be clear. So yes. I can get waste collected in my house for free. For free, you don't have to pay. Recyclable, recyclable waste. waste. Not your bones and your leftover amala. Thank we'll you. Get to, now be we'll get to that organic waste very soon, but recyclable waste. Because even organic waste, we put it to use. We have an Ogogunyo facility that the government has given us uh, funds to bring back to life. We make fertilizers, about 500 on a, on a daily basis. Wow. Very enlightening. Mm -hmm. The Managing Director, Lagos Waste Management Authority. Mr. Ibrahim Odumboni. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. We must bring you back here to come and tell us more about all, because this has been very, very enlightening. And I hope that you viewers got enough, I mean, as much as we got from talking to the managing director Are this morning. Are more interested in the Thank wealth part? Okay, just, just go. Waste to wealth. Yeah, he did speak about that. Thank you very much You're for coming, welcome. Mr. Thank Odumboni. You, Sunrise will be right back with the home stretch in just a moment. Stay with us. That song. I don't even know the title yet, but we'll get into that. Why are you looking at me like that and smiling? Ajibo Hustlers. Okay, I'll frown then. It's not working either. It's an Afro-urban contemporary duo. duo. Uh, they came into Limelight in 2020 after the release of the song Barao, which you may still get to hear. And it caught the attention of Davido, who eventually teamed up with them to release... Barao Remix. Uh, recently, the duo was announced by Apple Music as first artists to be featured in Nigeria's local Up Next program, an initiative geared towards identifying and showcasing rising talents. And they are here with us in the studio, Ajabo Hustlers. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you. Thank you. You're looking like hustlers, though. <laughs> <laughs> You it's look okay. like you made it. You're Have not you? hustling anymore. <laughs> We're still on the grind. We're still on the grind. <laughs> are you grinding? Pepe. <laughs> the music. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, um, you are? Knowledge. You are knowledge. knowledge. Yeah. And you are? Piego. Oh, Christ Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I had to ask if they were Nigerians. <laughs> are you they Nigerians? Are. You're Nigerians, yeah. yeah. Okay. Now you are smiling. That looks a little better. <laughs> First of all, um, why this particular song, this, this particular theme in the song? Is that something most young artists do? Yeah, um, we actually have random ideas we create in the studio. And it just happened to be one of those songs we just recorded. And then um, sometime early 2020, um, we needed to put out a song. 
and then we were trying to you know play the songs for some industry heads just to you know be sure of what to put out next and they all picked the song and we did a little freestyle on Instagram that went viral too so and we just really wanted to in that song we wanted to talk about um the um problems we face day to day um the situations that we go through problems um, you face we all face like a, a Nigerians because we have we have a voice we have a platform and not everybody has that platform and we should be able to um speak up for the people and then um highlight or like shed some light on the things people go through every day and why this particular i i could see that you are trying to picture some who is that who is the character in the video um what's your knowledge of that knowledge okay um the video was like we we um interrogating like the police officer because at the message was br police brutality and um, okay. You could see in the video also like a politician stocking money in the, in his living room. So we were just trying to shed light about all the things in the song. So that's NSAS all over again? No, I mean, that, that's pre-NSAS, right? Yeah. It was that's before NSAS. Yeah, yeah, it was before NSAS, okay. yeah. And okay. so it was kind of like mm. you predicted it was going to happen. <laughs> I won't say predicted, it's like it's a day-to-day -day activity that happens oh. in Nigeria, like every day like people have been harassed by police and every day so we we decided that we should talk about these things because the people that listen to our music they face these things and there is no one that speaks for them yeah so we decided to depict it in the video okay knowledge you are the rapper yeah and you are the singer yeah how did you find each other um it was back in 2010 in Pasakot. We were working at a restaurant, a catering restaurant, both Margaret. Of you? Yeah. Both of you? Yeah, both of us. Together at the same time? Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, so I played my song. I did a freestyle for Don Jazzy's Enigma. So I played it for him, and he liked it, and he invited me to his studio. Then I got to his studio. That's how we started making music. Oh, you already had a studio at the time? Um, not exactly my studio. I had... Um, a friend that you owned the studio, access yeah. access to... Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, we, we could work there without paying. So I told him to come over so we could work. And what was the... How, tell us, you know, your foray into music. How did you even get into it in the first place? You said you were working together in a restaurant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so was the music thing before the restaurant or after? It was after. Um, when I got out of secondary school, um, I, I didn't have anything I was doing. I was waiting for admission. And then um, I was, that was just when I was trying to, I had a friend, Azunda, who was um, trying to get me into music to record. And I realized I needed money to record. So I had to look for a job. My mom's friend um, hooked me up with a catering company where I met knowledge. Um, so that was where I was just working, you know. I think I was paying, I was, we were being paid about 15K every month, yeah. yeah. That's what we met. Yeah. Yeah. I was, was that even minimum wage at the time? <laughs> <laughs> so you met and then... You were being exploited. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, but uh, don't worry, don't sue the, the restaurant. <laughs> but, okay, now, so, how did you now get into music, uh, you know, performance, production, and stuff like that? Okay, um, so, we were just, act we were just basically recording in Potaka, we just hopes for, you know, we blowing up Sunday, there was really no investor, there was really no platform. And then there was a song he featured me on that actually went viral back in 2013, Tombo Music, it was actually big in Port Harcourt. So that was the first time we had that gained, like, good reception. So we sort of, like, built on it, you know, kept on dropping more songs. And I think sometime around 2015, you know, we just felt like there was no need making songs, me featuring him or he featuring me, like, we should just join forces and then make the music together. So where did the name Ajebo Hustlers come from? Um, is it because you both are Ajebo? <laughs> it's just like a reflection of where we came from. We were raised in Port Harcourt. Um, OGRA is like the suburbs of Port Harcourt. And we, we grind for, we basically grind for everything we've gotten this far. So we've all, always had a hustling spirit in us. That was why we said Ajebo Hustlers. Now why Ajebo? Why not? Knowledge and Diego <laughs> Of course, because we, we just wanted something that 
people won't misconcept once they get okay. to know us, once they come across our music. Mm. And I see that you both have handbags. <laughs> <laughs> Is that part of the, uh, being a Jebo? <laughs> 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 Well, okay, the uh, Jebel Hustlers will be featured across Apple Music's Nigeria Up Next playlist. Mm. Now, tell us about that. How big is it? Yeah, it is big because I think we're the first, we're actually the first artists to be featured on the Apple Music Up Next um, playlist. And um, it's, it's a playlist that like showcases African talents um, to the world because there's a lot of subscribers to um the, the platform yeah uh, okay uh, tell us uh, n you know knowledge um how has it been it's been like uh, going to 10 years no, no going to 11 years now yeah so. okay how has it been for you in the music industry in nigeria it's been it's been quite a journey because from the beginning of our career we weren't like getting enough so everything we made we had to put all of them back into the music so people would, who could at least record like new tracks and shoot videos. So it was really a tough, it was really a tough one till 2020 when we had Barawo, because that was when we started making money. Okay, now tell me, until 2020 when you made Barawo, yeah. um, how did David O come to catch your eye? Oh, so, I mean, the other way around. The other way around. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, our management, Avante Concepts, mm -hmm. um, he's Sam Frank and David Avante, they're friends with Asa. So um, at the time when we did the song, we were, we were looking at what next we were going to do for the song to amplify, to get more people to listen to the song. So Sam Frank played the song for Asa, and Asa played it for David, and he loved it, and he told us to come through. That was how. And that was your break. Yeah. And as they say, the rest is history. history yeah. Or the history is still just being made. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so then, I mean, I, I, the, the fact that you came into Limelight with a song, a social political um, awareness song, yeah. how, is that something that you think is an identity you want to play on or it's just one of those things that happened? Um, We've always made songs like that over 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 the years. Um, even in our album that just dropped, Post Lifestyle Volume One, we have a song, Oh My Own, that actually still, you know, highlights that talks about um, basic amenities that people in Nigeria or people in Africa pray for. And these are certain things that these are things that should be provided to us, not to be prayed for. Um, so it's all just always a vibe in the studio, you know. We just play a bit and then just vibe. If the if the if if the vibe leads us to make a song that's conscious, we make it. If it's a happy song, we make it. But we just record all the time, like every day we record and just stack them up in the studio. And when it's time for us to release it, we we'll put it out. Just so you know, that's an, a word you need to use in your vocabulary, vibe. Don't just sing the vibe, just so you know. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Diego, you said um, you were working at a restaurant. Yeah. Um, when you left school and yeah. you were trying to get admission. Yeah. What happened to the admission thing? Did you shelf it? No, I did. I, did. I, I, I actually got admission, um, I think, a year after, yeah, into Anambra State University, mm -hmm. the Byram campus. And I studied mass communication. Ah. So. OK. Yeah. What about you, sir? <laughs> I dropped out. <laughs> Why did you drop out? Of uh, course, I believed the music more than, because I just, I couldn't just do the two. I just knew that I wanted to do music and that was the reason why I dropped out. So you, you didn't influence him enough? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm going to put it on you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it wasn't like, it wasn't, it wasn't such a good experience, like it wasn't, it wasn't really a, you know, it wasn't so comfortable for me going to school because, because, my mom and my dad, like, they were just on my neck to, like, they were like, you can do whatever you want to, but you have to. Go just, to school. Yeah, I have to finish this, yeah. Okay, now, so, what are some of the challenges you have encountered? You said between 2010 and 2020, it was yeah. anything but rosy. Yeah. What are some of those challenges you encountered? Um, being on the, pl on the right platforms, 
to get our music heard. It was really difficult because we coming from Potako to Lagos, the hub of entertainment is really quite difficult. So breaking in was a major challenge for us. Okay. That's one. Is that all? There has to be more. Yeah, finance too. I mean, you need, you need money to sustain as an artist in Lagos and then you need money to put out projects and shoot videos. So financial difficulties was one, that was just one of the problems that we had. Mm. So, so how did you surmount it? What was, did some miracle happen? So um, what we did actually was, um, the only genius thing we did was we just made the most out of any situation we found ourselves. If we had just 500k to shoot a video, we would look for a director that could shoot for that amount. And at the point when, when we got to the point where we could shoot videos for a million or 1.5 or 2 million, we did it. And the, when we got to the point where we could shoot more, we did it. But we just kept, kept it going at every point. Why didn't you call me? So life is good. Why didn't he call me when he had 500,000 naira for, for a video? <laughs> <laughs> life is good, huh? Yeah. Okay. Great. No, so, so what's next? That's it. For Ajibo Hustlers. Um, we are shooting more videos from our, of our album, Ghost Lifestyle Volume 1. Um, the video for Yafu Yafu is out. And what's Yafu Yafu about? Yafu Yafu, uh, it means plenty when something is plenty. Mm -hmm. And the song talks about a, a lady giving you too much wahala, your woman, like, if we marry, that you're going to do... You're sitting next to a lady. <laughs> <laughs> so watch it. <laughs> Maybe yeah. you should rescue him. Uh -huh. <laughs> Talking about that. Let him finish. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, so, so that if my, back right hand, if my back hand wants to fly <laughs> at him... <laughs> Yeah, so it's just basically like the um, challenges that comes with being in a relationship with a woman. Speaking from the man's experience, the man's side of the story. Uh, you're going to uh. have to do the, the flip side. Uh. You're going to have to I see. Woman. Okay. So what has your experience been with women that uh -huh. made you sing that song? I told song? you. I warned you. Uh, <laughs> it's just, it's just, it's been amazing and it's a bittersweet experience. But me, I just like talking about my experience in my music because I feel like people experience these things and they can relate. But you look too young to have had <laughs> bittersweet, so many experiences. Maybe it's something like bitter lemon. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's, some, some, it's just like most of them are my friends, so I still put it in my music. Like Okay. So the Nyafu Nyafu therefore refers to what? The love in Nyafu Nyafu or the trouble in Nyafu Nyafu? Which one? The problem Nyafu Nyafu. The problem in Nyafu, oh my God. <laughs> but that's not going to stop you. No, no, no. You are no. in a relationship, aren't you? No, I'm not. Now? No, I'm not. Because but you were? Yeah, I was, yeah. Sometime the problem around. was Nyafu Nyafu, so you ran. Yeah, yeah. But actually, my verse, like, my, my own verse in Nyafu Nyafu is... It's just a reflection of a true life story that, like, something I've, I've been in, yeah. Because sometime around 2020, just before the pandemic, um, I was seeing someone and it, it didn't really end well. And it was, we, we didn't have the, the chance to go out and you know, have fun and everything. So it was really telling on me mentally. Mm. So that was just when I was writing my verse for Yafu Yafu and it went all, <laughs> all in the song. <laughs> Okay, I, I think that the, 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 the least we can, can wish you both is well. Um, having been in the, in, in the broadcast industry for long enough, you know, we've seen uh, ups and downs. So let me just ask you both now, because I don't want to hear it in the future. Is there anything that can make you both break up? No, I don't think so. I think P squared said the same thing. Yes, <laughs> and those were identical twins. Yeah. Mm. We have a, we have the thing about us is um, first we're not brothers, but we have a common goal, and then we have like we have a vision, and we share oh, that we share the same vision. We want to conquer the world. We want to add our own quota to Afrobeat. You know, push the the culture, mm. and um, we have not even started yet. I mean, okay. So when the big box start rolling in, as in dollars start rolling in, you sure your egos won't get in the way, one? You sure the money won't get in? Money always causes trouble. Mm. Not sure only money, women. No, no. Money no. won't cause trouble. <laughs> no, it wouldn't, because I, I love doing music, and I love the way, like, the creative process 
that we go through in making music. I don't think I want to like break out from this kind of process because it's way more easier for me to make music. As and a make duo. music with him. Yeah, as a duo, yeah, with him. It's way more easier because I don't tend to think too much about the hook. The hook is there. I just have to write my verse. So. Okay. I'm going to assume, which is the lowest <laughs> level of knowledge, that you both already worked out the sharing formula and everything. I don't want to be part of that conversation. <laughs> yeah. Don't say anything about it. <laughs> but for now, we have to thank you very much for thank being you. a part of our thank conversation. You. Thank this you so morning. much for having us. Yeah. Uh, Ajabo Hostler's uh, knowledge and Pierre Go. I don't mm. even want to go into the specific names. I will go into the specific names. George Danderson yeah. and um, Isaiah Precious. Yeah. You guys are not Nigerians. But thank you very much for being a part of our, uh, the program today, and we wish you well. Thank so you. Knowledge and Piego wrap up today's show for us on Sunrise. We'll bring you a fresh edition next week. I'm Alero Edu, wishing you a very happy weekend indeed, and see you next week. And I'm Ayo Makinde. Be safe. Bye-bye.